أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين بارئ الخلائق أجمعين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا وحبيب قلوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا وشفيع ذنوبنا أبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على الصلاة والسلام على آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المذلومين لا سيما الحجة ابن الحسن صاحب الزمان مولانا ومولى القونين عجل الله تعالى فرجه الشريف اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد أما بعد فقد قال الله تبارك وتعالى في كتابه وهو أصدق القائلين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم هو الذي أرسل رسوله بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله ولو كره المشركون صلى الله عليه محمد محمد Tonight we begin a series of three lectures to mark and to celebrate the birth of the Imam of our time Imam Sahib Al-Zaman Ajal Allah Ta'ala Farajah Al-Sharif Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad And the verse of the Qur'an that I have begun with is from Surah Al-Saf, chapter 61 of the Qur'an, verse 9, in which Allah says, He, it is Allah, who sent His Messenger with guidance and the religion of truth, لِيُذِرَهُ عَلَى الدِّينِ كُلِّ وَدِينِ الْلِّ So that it may prevail over all other religions, even if this is detested and even if this is averse to the polytheists. This verse of the Qur'an has also been repeated in Surah At-Tawbah, chapter 9 of the Qur'an, in uh, verse 33. And with a slight difference, it also appears in Surah Al-Fatih, uh, chapter 48, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says, هُوَ الَّذِي أَرْسَلَ رَسُولَهُ بِالْهُدَى وَدِينِ الْحَقِّ لِيُظْهِرَهُ عَلَى الدِّينِ كُلِّ and then he says, وَكَفَى بِاللَّهِ shahida," And Allah suffices as a witness. And this verse will form the basis um, of our discussion uh, in part. Because uh, just as the Qur'an itself is a miracle, one of the miracles of Islam is its prophecies. And what it has told us of that which is to come from the time that the Qur'an was revealed to the end of the world. And so Islamic literature has gathered a large amount of uh, such uh, material in the form of uh, verses of the Qur'an firstly and then also um, a hadith. So there's a lot of textual evidences on, on uh, matters to do with uh, eschatology. Um, and so this is one of those prophecies in which the Qur'an says that Allah has sent his messenger with this religion of truth so that it may prevail over all other religions. Now, before we go further, it is important that I mention and clarify a little bit what Islam and the Quran refers to when it says that this religion may prevail over all other religions. Because I am very cognizant of the fact that these lectures tend to somehow make their way to the internet. And a lot of times they are not just heard by Muslims, but even by non-Muslims, by Jews, by Christians and others. And it can very easily lend itself to the idea that Islam has a militant agenda to est essentially wipe out all other uh, religions and to basically force everyone into a submission or kill them. Uh, and unfortunately this sort of an agenda tends to be uh, um, vocalized by some uh, militant and fundamentalist groups who call themselves Muslims but we do not subscribe to that belief. So it is important to clarify here that when the Quran talks of deen and when it talks of Islam it generally understands the religion of God to be only one. In Nadina in the Lahil Islam. But this Islam is not a proprietary form of religion where the Jews say our religion is based on the Torah and we are the followers of Moses and our religion is Christianity and we are the followers of Jesus and we follow the Bible and you Muslims 
follow Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad and your book is the Quran and so on. And this sort of thinking in itself is flawed um, and it has given rise to even individuals who promote a, a, a pluralistic idea of religion to say that all religions are correct and all religions are fine and lead to God. Essentially the Quran's message is that there is only one religion with God. These messengers are not to bring different paths to you. They all bring the one path, which is the path of Tawheed, the path of monotheism, the idea that there is only one God to be worshipped besides whom there is none. So when the Quran says that he, it is God who sent his messenger with guidance and with the religion of truth, so that it may prevail over all other religions, the idea here is that this religion is meant to realign any uh, false ideas that may have entered that one original religion that Adam, peace be on him, came with. The same religion that Noah came with. The same religion that Ibrahim came with. It was the same thing that Dawood and Sulaiman and Musa and Zachariah and Yahya alayhi salam came with the same idea. That was Islam as well. In other words, that religion which will prevail will not be to say that the other religions um, have to be eliminated. It simply means they have to come to an agreement of one truth and remove any misconceptions and wrong ideas in them. And as we shall see in our discussion, that with the coming of the Imam and with this prophecy being fulfilled, a large number of individuals from other faiths will not be fought against and killed, but rather will change their views and submit to that one religion, to that one Islam that was always the religion that God had planned for mankind. So in essence there is only one truth and one religion, and that religion is one of complete submission to Allah. That is the religion of Tawheed, and that is the deen al-haq that Allah is talking about. The second point to keep in mind is that last year I also had the honor of speaking here on the 15th of Sha'ban and we talked about the signs for the return of the Imam and tonight we shall do the same as well but last year when we talked about these alamat of dhuhr as we call them the, the prophecies and signs for the reappearance they were based on events we broke them down into general signs we broke them down into specific signs and into definite signs and those signs that must come or must take place before the return of the Imam what we wish to do this time around though is to talk about these signs not so much as events but in a sequential form so that there is a greater understanding of these events when they occur in what sequence they occur and how they happen and what different regions of the world they affect. Now the idea is not simply to satisfy the curiosity that most people tend to have with regards to apocalyptic matters and with regards to eschatological matters. Everyone is curious to know when is the world coming to an end. A lot of times it's because people are fed up with their lives and they want something disastrous to happen so that there is some excitement and some change in their lives. But the idea here is not to simply talk about them for the sake of it. The idea is that through understanding these signs, we may in somehow or some way come closer to the Imam of our time and make his presence in our lives uh, more real so that it's not simply a theory that we live with to say yes we know there is an Imam and he is alive and he will return but that we somehow are able to connect with him and feel his presence in our lives and we somehow uh, um, relate to what he stands for and prepare ourselves with his coming and his return inshallah. Now, last year when we talked about the signs, the summary of those signs that we, we, we made was that you can talk about signs for not just weeks but months because there are hundreds and hundreds of riwayat and ahadith both from Shia and Sunni sources. However, you will always run into issues like for example, you will find some traditions that contradict each other. Then you need to verify which ones are authentic, which ones are not you will run into issues where there might be names of places and people that you can no longer identify because of them being very um, ancient. Um, you will run into issues where when these signs take place people will try to explain them away with some scientific evidence and so on and so forth. And so what we concluded last year was that essentially after knowing all these signs, not that they're not important, 
what is of greater importance is that one should prepare oneself spiritually. The purity of the heart and its ability to recognize who the right Imam is, is far greater than simply knowing the signs and memorizing them. And inshallah, maybe tomorrow or day after, when we develop the subject further, and we will talk about the reasons why individuals might reject the Imam when he returns, this will become uh, more clear. So, um, just to give you an idea then, before we really get into the subject, the, the, uh, the plan of our discussion over these three nights is that tonight we want to talk about the signs, but then slowly between tomorrow and day after, we want to shift the discussion from simply the signs of his return to talking about what are the reasons why individuals who today believe in him, who acknowledge him, who constantly pray for his return, would reject him. And there is a close connection between that discussion and this discussion of the signs, but it will come to light as we, um, as we discuss, inshallah. What I would like us to keep in mind for tonight as we discuss these signs is that notice that as I list these signs and the sequence in which they occur, notice the ordinariness of the events. Notice that in their narration, they're not happening in a miraculous manner. It isn't signs where angels are descending or an army of angels coming down with uh, um, swords and that sort of a thing or an imam waving a magic wand and miracles happening. It's happening through the kind of processes that you would very much see today if there was a change in a society, whether it was military or political or social or psychological. So try and keep that in mind, and I will mention it as we go, inshallah. And if we keep this in mind, that the changes that the imam brings about right from the reappearance have an element of humanness, very ordinariness to it, then the other discussion on why individuals might reject the Imam will also become uh, easier to understand um, tomorrow onwards, inshallah, if we can recite a salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Salla ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Now, um, the source for all these discussions that I am bringing out in terms of signs, because individuals tend to be curious, where are you bringing this from? Um, I'm relying a lot for tonight's discussion on a book called Asr al-Zuhur. Uh, Asr al-Zuhur is authored by uh, Sheikh Ali Qurani, who is a contemporary scholar and lives in Qum, Iran. And he is highly respected in the Shia world and an authority on the discussion of uh, Imam al-Mahdi and the signs of his return. Um, I favor this book because this book was originally written some um, 25, 26 years ago. But the author has not just left the book alone. He continues to research the traditions and the narrations in the book to verify its authenticity, and he keeps updating it. And so the present version that I have been using is the 11th edition of the book. Um, and it is structured in a, a sequential manner that makes it more easier to understand how the events are interrelated. So inshallah, this is the source. Um, and uh, where it isn't, I will mention that as well. The interest in the return of the Imam and the signs of his reappearance uh, takes a radical shift after the year 1979. And this is because of the revolution, uh, the Islamic revolution of Iran. Um, it would be um, uh, hard to deny that, that this revolution of Iran that Imam Khomeini uh, uh, initiated played an important role in the interest that individuals have taken in the return of the Imams and his signs. If you speak to the elders in the community, you will find that prior to 1979, where there wasn't this resurgence of awareness in Islamic studies and Islamic sciences, when people had not heard of books of hadith and nobody knew what al-Kafi even means, um, you will find that the ideas that individuals had about the Imam were very uh, sketchy and in many ways flawed. For example, a popular belief was that there was a green island where the Imam lived and uh, uh, there were re incidents related to that green island where his sons ruled on those islands. There were some narrations that many times the enemies of the Shias will quote and prove 
or bring out as evidence to show that the Shias are misguided. They say the Shias believe that their Imam is living in a cave or hiding in a cave somewhere waiting to return and so on. These sort of ideas that the Imam lives in a cave or an island and is waiting to return, these were more popular prior to that. It is not that the ulama changed their mind and said, no, no, that was wrong and now we believe something else. The ulama always had a correct understanding, but that was not accessible to us because before the revolution, a lot of this material was not even being translated into languages that we can um, comprehend or interact with. But the under correct understanding was that the imam is actually not isolated. He is very much present in our society, living in our midst. He is not in ghaibah in the sense that he is invisible. He is in ghaibah in the sense that his identity is not known. If he was sitting in this room right now, we wouldn't know who he is. And that is why there are narrations to say that upon his return, there are many individuals who might see him and then say, I have seen this man before. He helped me on such and such an occasion, and so on and so forth. Added evidence to the fact that 1979 was an important uh, change is that a couple of in interesting events happened right around that time. In 1979 as well, obviously, was the revolution of Iran. Um, rumors began after that, in the early years of the revolution, that the FBI and the CIA have actually got a file on the 12th Imam, and they have collected all the information about him possible. The only thing missing is his photograph. And this rumor lasted for a long time, even in Iran, to such a degree that even now there are people who still subscribe to that understanding. Um, in the same year, 1979, a man by the name of Muhammad Abdullah al utaybi declared himself to be the Mahdi near the Kaaba, and he basically uh, hijacked the, sh the, the, the Haram, if you like. He basically took the Haram uh, with a group of soldiers and the government, the Saudi government, could not actually remove him for several days before they were able to storm the place and get and remove him. So at that point, you can see that the world, not just the Shia world, but the Sunni world as well, was thinking along those lines and, and, and uh, expecting so this, this sort of an event to take place. Because we know that when the Imam returns, he returns in Mecca near the Kaaba. And this individual tried to... Uh, uh, basically take claim in the same manner and he was overcome. Two years later in 1981 an author by the name of A.J. Quinnell, Quinnell wrote a thriller novel called The Mahdi and the novel is about um, the secret agents in the West essentially the UK and the USA the secret agents there create a puppet, uh, an Arab who they uh, groom for the role of the Mahdi. And then in the view of full Muslims during the season of Hajj, he basically declares himself as the Mahdi and brings all the Muslims to submit to his command. And so the thriller novel is based on this idea that there is an individual who takes all the Muslims in his control, and so all the Muslims listen to him, and then these Western secret service uh, services control him as a puppet. And that's the idea behind the novel, which then sparked other interests in movies and so on and so forth. And the novel itself is called The Mahdi. Um, the same year, 1981, a documentary came uh, to the world discussing the prophecies of Nostradamus in the name of the man who saw tomorrow. Anybody who was 10 years old by then has probably seen that documentary, right? A very popular. I'm sure many of us here have seen The Man Who Saw Tomorrow. And uh, this documentary, The Man Who Saw Tomorrow, was shown in the U.S. for three months consecutively on the televisions. And in that documentary, there is essentially prophecies that are um, modified to promote this idea that there is a man from the Middle East who wears a turban and he essentially starts an attempt to take over the world and he destroys Europe. And in that time, Russia was still USSR and was a superpower. So then the US and, and, and the USSR, the two superpowers, get together to defeat this Mahdi, essentially. Now this is not new, the idea of using prophecies like Nostradamus to control the masses and the minds of people. Even Hitler used it during 
uh, the Second World War, where he would have planes flying over regions and throwing thousands and thousands of pamphlets showing prophecies of Nostradamus that he will take over this and that so that they should not resist and fight him. And the idea in that documentary was not so much to promote the belief of a savior or the return of Jesus or the return of a Mahdi or whether Nostradamus was even right or wrong or what he was prophesizing, but the idea was to create this fear and to assassinate the character of an individual whom the Muslims are waiting for um, so that uh, in the minds of at least the individuals in the West, this would stay firm that Islam is dangerous and must be stopped from expanding. And that Islamophobia has continued from that time uh, right up to now as well, very much um, alive. Um, and to some degree then, um, this idea of instead of yearning for the return of a savior of the Mahdi, to be afraid of the return of this Mahdi in the minds of the non-Muslims has been promoted, this idea has continued to be promoted to some degree by the Muslims themselves. Because when Muslims discuss this idea of the return of the Imam, there tends to be an emphasis on the aspects of the war and the fighting and the violence, that when the Imam comes there will be a global war and we will take up arms and we will fight and you know, kufr and batil will be uh, wiped out and, and uh, you know, we will have victory and we will dominate over others and that's the idea but there is some truth to that to a certain point which we will talk about but thereafter is where the real work starts and that is the work of when there is unity and there is love and there is peace and there is tranquility on the earth and human beings now are ready for a next phase in their spiritual evolution if you like where human beings are now taken to higher levels of thought, higher levels of understanding, um, more wisdom and more knowledge. And that is never discussed. Even when you look at the uh, qasidas and the mushayra that we compose about the imam, there tends to be about how America and England will be overcome and so on and so on. You will never hear any ash'ar talking about how the imam brings peace or how the imam helps human beings evolve to the next level. Uh, and that is because of our uh, lack of knowledge. And inshallah, we're going to try and correct that as well through these um, series of lectures and discussions. Now, keeping in mind, of course, our limited time, not just for tonight, but also in the three days, let us now actually begin discussing the signs. And these signs are so detailed, it would be impossible to do them in three days. So what I present here is a summary. If we finish our discussion tomorrow or day after on what are the reasons why uh, Muslims or even some Shias might reject the Imam on his return um, and we come to a satisfactory conclusion, then we can come back and discuss some of these signs in greater detail. But as I said earlier, what I wish to present this year, and it, there is no harm in discussing this every year so that we refresh ourselves and see this from different uh, perspectives, but what I wish to discuss this year, inshallah, is the events in sequence and in some ways geographically. Um, there are three personalities or individuals whose names keep, repeer, keep appearing in traditions and riwayat again and again closer to the time of the Imam's return. These three personalities are called Al Khurasani, Al Yamani, and As Sufiani. The first two being righteous and virtuous. And their names suggest either their lineage or the place they come from, uh, which is typical of the um, Arabic language. As you know, in Arabic, when you use names like uh, Khomeini or Sistani or Khui or Tabrizi or Shirazi, it's not their names, but it's simply the names of the cities that they come from. So Al Khurasani is an individual who comes from Khurasan, the province uh, northeast of Iran. Uh, Al Yamani is an individual who comes from Yemen. And As Sufiani is a descendant of uh, the Umayyads from Abu Sufyan. Now, Sufiani is the unrighteous or the evil individual um, whose rule does not last more than 15 months. And when he emerges, he establishes himself in Damascus. And he also invades Palestine. And we shall connect this to other signs. It is very important to keep this in mind, that his base is Damascus. The movement of the Imam, as we said, begins in Mecca. 
in Masjid al-Haram. And the first two communities and nations to come to the support of the Imam are from Iran through this individual al-Khurasani and from Yemen through this individual called al-Yamani. Al-Yamani is mentioned repeatedly again and again that the standard of Al-Yamani is that of guidance. If you know of the rising of Al-Yamani, do not fail to reach him. Do not oppose him and support him. Now, as far as the support of the group from Iran is concerned, whether that support is as a government or whether it is not as a government or if the government changes in how it is shaped today or does not exist as the government does today, but there is a group from Khurasan, this force that we are just referring to as the Iranian force, their role and support for the Imam in the books and riwayat suggests it starts much earlier, a lot before the coming of the Imam, and that they will fight long wars with enemies, and they will continue prevailing over their enemies until closer to the Imam's time when two individuals of prominence will rise from Iran. This will be one group, their political and spiritual leader is simply referred to as Al-Khurasani. And they have a military wing to this, and the military leader is called Shu'ayb bin Salih. It is important to remember these two names, because these two names re refer again and again, not just in the book that I have looked at, but in all the books, Al-Khurasani and Shu'ayb bin Salih as the leader of the military from this group from Iran or Khurasan is mentioned again and again. Last year when I talked about Al-Khurasani, I also mentioned briefly what we know from our books on the path that this group takes in Iran, where they start from, where they grow, what, the, what are the different cities and regions they go through in Iran before they meet with the Imam. And uh, that would take a lot of time to repeat. Um, if you're able to listen to that, uh, again you can, or inshallah if we're able to discuss it in future, we will. As far as the helpers who come from Yemen, their role is not so much in advance as that of the group from Iran. Their role is just a few months before the Imam, such that if the Imam was to return at the end of Dhul Hijjah or at the early, uh, between Ramadan and Dhul Hijjah, um, actually between Ramadan there is an announcement of the return of the Imam, but he publicizes himself more towards Dhul Hijjah and Muharram. These groups of Sufyani and Yamani and Al-Khurasani tend to be more prominent sometime in Rajab. Some of the riwayat say the month of Rajab. Some of them say just a few months before the Imam. Some riwayat says that all three groups will begin their movement and start publicizing themselves on the same year, in the same month, on the same day. So they are very significant in the uh, roles uh, uh, that they play. The Yemeni group plays an important role because of their proximity to Hijaz, which is present-day Saudi Arabia. And those of you who may not be familiar with the landscape of the Middle East, I would urge you to go home and look at this on the internet before you come tomorrow so that you understand this better. For those of you who have lived in the Middle East or who understand this, you know the proximity of Yemen to, uh, to Saudi Arabia. They play an important role, the Yemeni group, because when the Imam appears, he starts his movement in Mecca, which is in Hijaz. And at that point, there is a vacuum in power and leadership in Hijaz. And we shall talk about this in a, in a few minutes. Um, amongst the riwayat and the signs that come to us, such as one from Imam Jafar al-Sadiq, salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad where he mentions the definite signs of Yamani and Sufyani and Khurasani, he mentions three other signs that I had talked about last year. One is a voice that is heard in the heavens that is called a sayha, a loud scream or a voice that we shall talk about briefly. The other is the murder of a pure soul that is called in books of riwayat as a nafsa zakiya. A nafsa zakiya is an individual who is extremely, extremely pious and he is murdered near the Kaaba in Masjid al-Haram, which as you know is a place and a sanctuary for people. Whoever enters it is meant to be peace, uh, who is, is meant to be safe and in peace, but he is murdered right near the Kaaba, very close to the coming of the Imam. And this is a major sign as well. And the third as well that the Imam mentions is that of a landslide between Mecca and uh, uh, Medina that is known as Al-Bayda. And we will talk about this. This is a landslide that swallows the army of Sufyani. So these are common signs that are repeated again and again as being definite signs. Uh, 
Now let's talk about the power vacuum in Hijaz. Most of the books that I have seen, um, they say that towards the time of the Imam, Hijaz will be ruled by kings. There will be a kingdom established. Remember that in Islam there was no mulukiyah, there was no kingdom. But as you know, today in Saudi Arabia there is a kingdom. They call themselves the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And the books of Riwayat say, the last king of Hijaz will be a man who will be called Abdullah. Now whether this Abdullah refers to the present king Abdullah or whether it is in future, we do not know. Nor are we intending to suggest that it is him. But this is in the books. Unfortunately, the riwayats, perhaps for uh, fears, uh, have not mentioned the name of the tribe. It just says there will be a king from Banu Fulan. Fulan means so and so, without actually saying the name, whether it is Saud or whoever. If it does refer to the present king of Abdullah, then an interesting thing to note is that the present king, Abdullah, is now 86 years old. What is more interesting is that if you Google King Abdullah's successor, you will find an article that appeared in a British newspaper, The Telegraph, on 10th February 2007, that said that the Saudi king has now lost the power to choose a successor. As of 2007, a change was made in the constitution and the legislation of the Saudi kingdom that henceforth the king shall not appoint a successor but a council will be established and the council will decide on who is the successor. And this council is made up of no less than 21 brothers of the present king, all the sons of Abdul Aziz, including grandsons. So they are many in number. Um, so it is very interesting to note that whereas there was no kingdom, now there is a kingdom, and to have a king with the same name, and within our lifetime to know that now the idea of successorship is lost and that there is a council. Now those who are familiar with how the Arabs tend to work and the uh, system that, on which many of the Middle Eastern governments work, you would know that in the Middle East, every region and every government is ruled by a particular tribe. And very often a tribe will appease the other tribes in their own land by making sure that they are materially uh, very well off so that there is no political uprising against them. But in reality there isn't as much unity as meets the eye. And I could have given more specific examples but perhaps it is not appropriate. Uh, but you will find this for yourself on the internet. Now, the books and the riwayat says that after this king dies, Again, a disclaimer, I don't know if it is this king or a one to come in the future. But after he dies, the people of Hijaz will never unite under one ruler. If a king is appointed, he will not rule for years, but he will rule for days and for months at most. And the tribes or the Qabail of Hijaz will begin fighting for power amongst themselves. Which is very, very easy to imagine actually if you understand how things operate in the Middle East. In one tradition in a riwayah, we are told that one of the signs of the zuhur of the imam is a disturbance between the haramain, between Mecca and Medina. And when the individual asked the imam, what kind of a disturbance is this? The imam said, it is a tribal fight in which 15 prominent members of one tribe will be killed by another tribe between the two harams. By the time this sort of a disturbance happens in Hijaz, Imam Jafar al-Sadiq sallallahu wa sallam alayhi says, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. You the Muslims as well will be left without an Imam or without any unity or flag to gather under. Some of you will be cursing others and some of you will be distancing yourselves from each other. You will be tested and you will be tried. You will be filtered again and again until very few of you are left. And hence in one riwayah it says when Islam began it was gharib. It was a stranger. And Islam shall return and become gharib. It shall once again become a stranger. And just as you entered Islam afwaja in droves and groups and groups. So shall you leave Islam in droves afwaja again groups and groups. Now this could mean in the literal sense where large numbers of people just turn away from Islam. 
or it could mean that in name everyone remains a Muslim but ideologically and in our aqidah we take such radical and extreme views that we become different groups while we are one community and this is the result in part of not having an Imam or not having a clear guide or having lost individuals with true knowledge or not having obedience and submission to these individuals who have a true understanding of Islam and a path of moderation and of promoting individuals who are misguided and therefore they become then the uh, um, source of new groups and divisions forming. At this point while all this is happening in Hijaz and while Muslims are in disunity and confused and disarray one of the greatest signs will then appear which is the voice that we talked about. There are many different things about this voice that I do not wish to go into because then we need to look at the riwayat on their authenticity. But what seems to be unanimous is that the voice will be heard from the heavens on the 23rd of the month of Ramadan. Whether it is the night of Ramadan or the day of Ramadan, um, I, will, I cannot verify that right now. But this voice will mention the name of the Imam and declare that he has returned. And again, there are variations on what this voice will say. Some have simply said the voice will be the voice of Jibra'il alayhi salam and he will declare that your Imam has returned. Respond to him. Some will say that the voice will simply say, Ja al haq wa zahq al batil, inna al batil kana zahuqa. Which is a verse of the Quran saying, Truth has come and falsehood has perished. Falsehood was a thing that was bound to perish. In any case, this voice is heard, and it is interesting that. During the time of Imam al-Baqir the ruling caliph uh, Muhammad wa Muhammad, the ruling caliph who was called al-Mansur was also intrigued by this idea and this narration and he talks to an individual called Saif bin Umaira and he says to Saif bin Umaira do you know that before the coming of the Mahdi a voice will be heard calling the name of a man from the descendants of Abu Talib this individual Saif, who was close to the Caliph, he said to him, Are you sure? I have never heard of anything so fantastic like this. To which Mansur replies, and you can see that the enemy as well, his trust and his faith in the Imams from the Ahlul Bayt This is Mansur, the Caliph, who is saying this to Saif. He says, Sami'atuhu min Abu Ja'far Muhammad bin Ali. Walaw yuhadithuni bihi ahl al kullihim ma qabiltuhu minhum. وَلَكِنَّهُ مُحَمَّدْ بِنْ عَلِي I have heard this myself from Abu Ja'far al-Baqir alayhi salam and had I heard this from the whole world and anyone else in the world I would not have believed this but this I have heard directly from Muhammad bin Ali peace be on him meaning he says I have absolutely no doubt that before the coming of the Imam or the final uh, uh, savior of Islam the Mahdi alayhi salam a voice will be heard from the heavens calling out a name of a descendant of uh, Abu Talib. After this calling out, now we take a, 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 a digression here. I said at the start of the lecture, I want you to see that there is ordinariness to everything that happens. The books are not very clear that when this voice is heard, how is it heard? Is it heard miraculously because it says that everyone will understand it in their own language? Or is it heard using some modern means and technology that will be available at that time? There are individuals in the Shia community who will get very upset if you try and suggest that this is through technology. Because they are convinced that it is only happening through miraculous means. What I want you to be open to is the idea that it could happen either way. And you will understand the importance of this inshallah tomorrow day after when we talk about the reasons why individuals might reject the Imam. So it is important to keep in mind that while many of these things appear amazing and fantastic and miraculous they may come to us in very very ordinary circumstances which may cause and lead individuals to doubt after this calling out we are told the Imam will begin communicating first with only a few individuals amongst his helpers but the news of his return will begin spreading around the world like wildfire rumors will, rumors will go around and the world will begin talking about this savior who has returned this will cause many governments to panic because of the rate at which people will talk and show eagerness for it. And in the books of Riwayat, we are told that individuals will be so excited, وَيَشْرَبُونَ حُبَّهُ They will drink from his love. 
Now, uh, again, we shall uh, uh, talk about uh, the implications of this uh, more uh, tomorrow or day after. But the enemies will be fearful of him, and there will essentially be an attempt to hunt for this individual and to look for him at all costs. And the rumors and the news will be that he is presently in Medina al Munawwara, which at the time will be true because he will be in Medina. And at that point, an army will move from Syria, which will be the army of Sufyani, towards Medina in an attempt to stop this individual, to look for him and basically kill him. And at that point, we are told a lot of individuals will be killed on the suspicion that they are Shias. Many Shias will be killed in Medina. Many women and children will be taken as captives. And we are told the Imam will leave Medina and head towards Mecca under very... Uh, uh, under, uh, under circumstances where there is a lot of fear surrounding the area. So he will leave with a lot of uh, uh, caution and uh, secrecy. And this will be the sunnah of the Prophet Musa salam, because when Musa salam killed a man in, e uh, in Egypt and, f and, and left Egypt under the same uh, 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 circumstances of caution and secrecy, the Quran says he left khaifan yataraqqab he left in a sense of fear watching over his shoulder, in a sense being cautious not to reveal himself too much to people. And the Imam will do the same and come to Mecca. In Mecca he will establish contact with other helpers and aides. Again notice how this is so ordinary at face value, something that you can relate to and understand. Um, yet it is miraculous behind the scenes. By the time he comes to Mecca and establishes himself there and begins communicating with some followers, we are now in the month of Muharram. Now we are told in riwayat that on the night of Ashura, after Salatul Isha, in Masjid al-Haram, next to the Kaaba, the Imam will openly declare himself as the Mahdi that the Muslims have been waiting for. There will be an attempt obviously by individuals to stop him and to kill him even right there and then. This will be his first speech in Mecca and his helpers who will be with him will stop him from being killed and will basically overcome the enemies who are trying to harm him. The next day, on the day of Ashura, the Imam will address the whole world at large and he will invite them to come to his help. And everyone will then listen to his address in their own language. And again the same issue, does he address the whole world miraculously? Or does he address the whole world through a form of media, through some means of technology? You should be open to both ideas, and we shall understand why in the days to come. But there will obviously be different reactions to this. And there are individuals amongst the Shia communities of a certain mindset who have failed to understand the true message of Islam, what the Ahlul Bayt stand for, what is the significance and the importance of the coming of the Mahdi and the role he plays in the evolution of human beings because of which their reaction will be very predictable. For example, one reaction that we can imagine is that today is the day of Ashura, we should not be engaging in anything political. Today we should only be crying for Imam Hussein. So let's not listen to what this man has to say until tomorrow. Which will be very ironic, isn't it? Because the Imam has come primarily, one of, his thi one of the things he represents is the avenging the murder of his grandfather Imam Hussein salam. This is a big part of the return of the Imam and his revolution. And because of that attitude and that mindset, there are individuals who will lose out on one of the greatest blessings that they could have ever uh, imagined. So there is a certain mindset, there is a certain thought process, and this is something that I have talked about again and again in all the years that I have preached here and elsewhere that our failing and our swaying towards extremism either way, either in lacking in catching up with Ahlul Bayt or exceeding and going overboard is primarily because we love the Ahlul Bayt we want their fada'il, we remember them and recite their masa'il, which is all very good, but we do not understand how they think. Not that we can understand at their level of thought, but what I mean is they have a certain akhlaq, they have a certain value system, they have a certain code of ethics and morals which you will only understand if you read their ahadith 
if you read not just their fadail and masaib, but their teachings, and begin, we begin practicing what they, uh, what they have encouraged us to practice, it is only when we do that, then our values and our ethics and our morals and our thought process begins to align with theirs. And then we begin to think the way they think within our capacity. It is only then that we relate to them in the real sense. So we're not waiting for some superhuman who is not really the person who is coming. He may be superhuman in different ways. For example, he may be the greatest teacher of Tawheed in the world. But we are waiting for somebody who is going to show us certain types of miracles, yet we have no concern about knowing God, for example. So this will also be something that we will talk about, inshallah, uh, tomorrow day after. And uh, in the five or ten minutes that I have left for tonight, uh, let us see what else we can bring out in these uh, signs. Now that the Imam has announced himself in Mecca, he will also announce that I will not leave Mecca until one of the greatest prophecies that my grandfather Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad, wa ala Muhammad, that he had prophesied until that comes true, I will not leave Mecca. And that prophecy is the prophecy of the Prophet of Islam that an army will be swallowed in a landslide between Medina and Mecca. And this is the books that talk of the, the happening at Baida, or this outskirts of Medina. So essentially the army of Sufyani that left Damascus and came to Medina to chase the Imam, they will obviously find out that he is in Mecca and he has declared himself to the world and is inviting the world to come to uh, support his cause. And so they will now leave Medina and head towards Mecca. And as they come towards Mecca, somewhere between Medina and Mecca where they camp, a landslide will take place that will swallow literally the whole army. And it will have a miraculous nature to itself, such that those who are left behind, when they come forward to see what has happened, they will get swallowed as well. And those who have gone forward, when they come back to see what has happened, they will get swallowed as well. It is only when this has happened that the Imam will then take the next step. At this point, because of this vacuum of power in Hijaz, and the Imam having taken control of Mecca, that group of Al-Yamani from Yemen, and if you look at the map, you will see the proximity of Yemen to Mecca, that group now joins under the leadership of Yamani and pledges allegiance to the Imam at Mecca, and there is an army of about 10,000 people now that includes the 313 elite uh, uh, Shias of the Imam, and this army of 10,000 now goes to Medina, and there they meet some resistance from uh, what is left of Sufyani's army uh, at Medina. And they are overcome and the Imam essentially takes over Medina. So the Imam now has full control of Hijaz and Yemen. From there we are told the Imam will now proceed towards Iraq. As he proceeds towards Iraq, on the way he is met with the group or the army that has come from Iran, from Khurasan that is laid by Al Khurasani and Shu'aib bin Salih. And there is a lot of details into that meeting as well, but it is well beyond the scope of these three days. And I did speak a little bit about it last year, so that we're going to leave definitely. But the, the, the important part to take from that is that the army now swells, because now that the Imam, before reaching Iraq, he now has under his control Hijaz, Yemen, and Iran, with the groups of Al Yamani and Al Khurasani. We said these were the two primary groups that would initially help the Imam. And with this large army, the Imam now moves to Iraq, where again he's met with some resistance, and there are some skirmishes and battles there. Again, notice the ordinariness of the fact, and the humanness of the fact that there are battles that take place. And uh, he establishes himself in Iraq, and his capital is now the city of Kufa. Now there is a lot of... Um, what you might call poetic justice to this. Why? Because the grandfather of the Mahdi alayhi salam is Amirul Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib salawatullahi wa salam alayhi. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. And the grandfather of Sufyani is Muawiyah. Muawiyah's base was Damascus. Imam Ali's base was Kufa. They fought a major battle, which was the Battle of Sifin. Because of a group of hypocrites who were the Khawarij, that battle was left inconclusive. It never ended. 
that led to the formation of the Khawarij from whom came Ibn Muljim who assassinated Imam Ali when they were on the verge of victory at the battle of Siffin. So that inconclusive battle between Imam Ali and Muawiyah now will conclude because now history repeats itself where the descendant of Ali is established in Kufa and the descendant of Muawiyah is established in Damascus as Sufyani. And we shall see then what this uh, 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 turn uh, takes. Okay, so I think this is a good place to stop so that we have time to do wudu as well in time for salat. But at this point, uh, we see that the Imam has control of Hijaz and Yemen and Iraq and Iran. Um, and we are told all the uh, Gulf states. And... Uh, I want to conclude by just mentioning uh, two points that you should keep in mind uh, uh, for before we continue tomorrow. The first point is that the place that is of most interest to us at this point is Hijaz, because everything begins with Hijaz. The vacuum of power in Hijaz, the beginning of events starts with Hijaz. We are also interested in Al-Yamani and Al-Khurasani and Al-Sufiani, but their coming is very close to the time of the Imam. Whereas the other events of the tribal feuds and the fights may happen before that. So that is one thing. The other thing is the emphasis I've been making again and again, the ordinariness with which the events appear to be taking place. Because this will play an important role in understanding uh, why individuals might reject the Imam. In fact, we have a hadith uh, such as one from Imam Jafar al-Sadiq, sallallahu wa sallamu alayhi. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad in which he says that do not expect victory to come to you miraculously. You will have to fight for it and it will come to you as you gain ground inch by inch. You will suffer setbacks just as your enemy suffers setbacks. There will be losses on your side just as there are losses on the enemy's side. There will be many of you who will have to attain martyrdom as well and be killed as well. So there will be sacrifices to be made even on the side of the Muslims and even in the army of the Imam. It is not simply a case of now that the Imam has come, there is only us to be winning wars and no harm and no sacrifices on our side. And this again is very, very significant in understanding uh, some of the other matters that we shall be discussing inshallah tomorrow and uh, the night after. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on these blessed nights, insha'Allah, that may Allah bless us, our homes, our centers, with the present and the barakah of Imam al-Mahdi alayhi salam. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may he hasten the appearance of the Imam and may we be blessed with martyrdom so that instead of dying an ordinary death on our beds, we may die while sacrificing ourselves for truth and for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala under the banner of this Imam. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that for as long as we live, we may keep his, his presence alive in our hearts and in the hearts of our children, and that we may remember him every day, and that he may truly make a change in our lives, so that when we meet him, inshallah, he is proud to see us as a community and as individuals, as his Shias. Ameen, Ya Rabbal Alameen. Oh Allah, we ask you, bihaqqi Imam al-Hujja alayhi salam, we ask you, Allah, to grant shifa to those who are ill, and maghfira for all our marhumeen. ربنا تقبل منا إنك أنت السميع العليم سرعة أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين بارئ الخلائق أجمعين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا وحبيب قلوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا وشفيع ذنوبنا أبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد ثم الصلاة والسلام على آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين لا سيما مولانا ومولى القونين الحجة ابن الحسن صلوات الله وسلامه عليه اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد أما بعد فقد قال الله تبارك وتعالى في كتابه وهو أصدق القائلين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم هو الذي أرسل رسوله بالهدى ودين الحق 
ليظهره على الدين كله ولو كره المشركون صلاة على محمد صلي على محمد محمد Tonight is our second gathering in our topic which is the coming of the Mahdi alayhi salam may Allah hasten his return and these uh, discussions are to mark the birth of our Imam and we said yesterday that as a basis we uh, are using this verse of the Quran from chapter 61 Surah to Saf uh, verse 9 in which Allah says he it is Allah who sent his messenger with the guidance and the religion of truth so that it may prevail over all other ideologies and all other forms of religion even if this is averse to the polytheists now last night uh, we began discussing the signs for the Imam and uh, we stopped at a point where we showed how through a sequence of events the Imam after having declared his return um, his message spreads and he now has um, control over a large region within the Middle East that would include the present-day um, Hijaz, Yemen, Iran, Iraq and uh, he basically establishes himself in Kufa which is in Iraq and that becomes his capital and there are many narrations again with regards to Kufa and what happens after he establishes himself and how the believers vie against each other to possess a piece of land in Kufa and to own some property there and how he extends the mosque of Kufa and so on and so forth however that is outside our um, uh, discussions and uh, tonight we want to continue from that just as a quick note before we continue we also mentioned yesterday a few interesting uh, reactions from the world after the revolution of Iran in 1979 such as some novels and documentaries and movies that came forth uh, discussing this idea of an Islamic redeemer or savior and uh, one of my brothers also pointed out to me a couple of other uh, such publications that may be of interest to some of you um, one is a sci-fi novel by Frank uh, Herbert that was published in 1965 that was called Dune and the central character in this novel has a striking resemblance to uh, the concept of the Mahdi in, in Islam so some of you may already be familiar with this Another more recent publication is um, uh, a book that was published just two years ago, 2007, by a Wall Street Journal correspondent, and it's called The Siege of Mecca. And uh, yesterday we mentioned uh, a man by the name of Al Utaibi who had taken uh, siege or um, taken the Haram hostage during the, during the days of uh, pilgrimage and he had promoted his brother-in-law as the Mahdi and uh, after holding the Kaaba and the Haram um, for almost uh, two weeks he was then overcome so this book discusses that uprising and it also tries to show how um, the government of Saudi Arabia itself was not as radical as it is today and in many ways it became radicalized and started adopting a stricter understanding or form of Islam after this uprising uh, in 1979 and then the author tries to also show a connection with the Bin Laden family to say that the creation of Al Qaeda has in some way uh, a relationship to that uh, uprising of uh, the uh, false Mahdi and it is interesting actually if you go uh, on the internet and look at uh, Wikipedia and uh, search for the Mahdi there is actually a list of individuals who claimed to be the Mahdi in different centuries and different eras so there's a listing to say who are the individuals who claim to be the Mahdi 17th century 16th century 18th century 19th 20th and so on and then to each one of those names there is a history that you can go and read on um, and, and so it is obviously uh, very fascinating and a wide uh, um, area that you could uh, research on um, if you're interested 
But um, in staying within our original uh, plan to discuss the signs and then talk about what are the reasons why individuals might uh, reject the coming of the uh, Imam, uh, we continue and say that after the Imam has established himself in Iraq, in, in Kufa, um, and having been joined by the groups and forces from uh, al-Yamani and Khurasani as well, um, we are told from traditions and riwayat of a major uh, war or battle that takes place with the Turks, basically with Turkey. And the author that I have been referring to and mentioned yesterday as well, uh, in his research over the years, um, he says that at one point he used to believe that wherever the ahadith and riwayat refer to the Turks, the, that was actually a reference to the Russians because he felt at the time, in the earlier years when he was writing the book, that wherever eastern regions or eastern Europe or certain parts of the Middle East were mentioned, um, it generally referred to the Turk, to the Russians, because of the physical description that were given of these individuals. There are some groups of people where the country is not mentioned, but just the type of the people are mentioned. For example, the Riwayat might say, there will come forth an army of people whose shoes will be made of hair um, or who will wear fur clothes or who will have eyes that are uh, small or uh, um, be yellow skinned and so on and so forth. And so people have tried to understand is this a reference to the Chinese or to the Mongols or to the Russians and so on and so forth. However, this researcher, Sheikh Ali Qurani, in his recent writing in the 11th edition of his book, he says he is convinced that no, when the hadith and riwayat says that it, the Turk or the Turk, Turkish, it actually refers to Turkey. And therefore, um, it appears then that there would be a battle with Turkey um, against the Imam's army, which would obviously have grown to a larger number after being joined with the uh, group from Khurasan. Um, and the Imam now, because he has come with a divine mission, and he has set a ball rolling to establish peace and justice on the earth and remove all forms of injustices. Any force that comes against him will be vanquished and overcome. And so Turkey is then taken again within that fold of that uh, um, um, Islamic uh, government. Uh, so now you have, apart from Yemen and Hijaz and Iran and Iraq, and, and uh, uh, um, all the other states we mentioned previously, the Gulf states, you now have Turkey as well. From here now, um, the opposition and the battles take a more apocalyptic uh, um, scenario because now it involves people not just based on their nationality or the country, but based on their faiths. And largely, the faiths that Islam recognizes as uh, um, as, as religions is really Judaism and Christianity which the Quran refers to time and again as the people of the book. Now, we are told in the riwayat that thereafter the Imam will head towards Quds which would be Palestine and he will then face the army of Sufiani. Now Sufiani we said would invade Palestine and then he would establish himself in Damascus and that would be his capital. Um, but it appears that his major battle against the Imam would take place uh, when the Imam is heading towards Quds. And uh, it is interesting to also note that initially there are some discussions that take place between Sufiani and the Imam. And in some traditions and reports we are told that Sufiani is on the verge of surrendering to the Imam and negotiating with him. But there are certain groups, uh, certain Western powers, who the Riwayat simply refer to as the Romans. Now, obviously, at the time that the Imams were narrating these traditions, there wasn't a concept of US or um, UK or Canada or West as we know it today. So in those traditions, um, all these regions in the West were simply referred to as the Rum or the, the people of Rum, a Rum. There is even a chapter in the Quran called Surah to Rum. And uh, the modern day scholars generally understand that wherever a hadith say the Romans or Rome, it refers to the Westerners of today. So without knowing exactly which Western powers these are, we know that there are some quote unquote Romans and uh, a group from the Yehud. Now the Yehud is generally the Jews, 
but keeping in mind that not necessarily all the Jews are in favor of um, opposing Islam in a military sense. There are groups of Jews even today who are orthodox in their belief, and a large number of them reside in Iran as well, and they actually support the uh, government of Iran and are opposed to the state of Israel. So many a times where Riwayat speaks of the Jews, we may understand it to be the Zionists, really. So the Riwayats then say that these Jews or Zionists, along with the Western powers, will, will move Sufyani in a different direction. They will promise him military support and instead encourage him to fight the Imam, as a result of which there will be a major global war. The battlefield in this war, we are told, will extend from Akka. Akka is a, is a city on the coast of uh, um, occupied Palestine or Israel, if you like, uh, from Akka to Antakya in Turkey, and from a place called Tabriya all the way to Damascus and the entire inside of Quds. So that whole region is inflamed uh, with war. And the Riwayat say that the wrath of God will descend upon these people who oppose the Imam and they will be vanquished. And the Ahadith are very, very graphic here that we may understand in a symbolic manner. For example, there are traditions that say that even if one of them is hiding behind a rock, the rock will call out to the Muslim army or soldiers and say to them, there is an enemy hiding behind me, come and get him. So we may understand this in whatever sense we like, whether it is literal or symbolic. But the idea to, is to show that not, a, not any of them will be left. They will either surrender or they will be overcome. Now this global war, when it obviously uh, ends and the enemy is defeated, it will anger those who are left in the West or amongst the quote-unquote Romans, who we are told in the Riwayat now would be largely the Christians. A lot of the Christian groups even today who you find are very supportive of Israel, despite of the um, injustices that the, the state of Israel might be committing, you will find that their support is largely due to this biblical understanding that the Jews are the chosen people of God or the children of Israel. That is where they take that idea from. And the Quran talks of the Jews of having been chosen at one point by God, but then that is a long discussion to say what uh, um, they did to lose that status as well. So we're then told in a hadith, after this group of Westerners and Jews are defeated, this will anger a Christian group in the West, and they will start declaring a war against the Imam. Before the Muslims get into uh, um, a war with the Christians, another major sign will appear, and this will be the descent of uh, Nabi Isa or Jesus, peace be upon him. Now this will be a sign that the Muslims have been waiting for, and the books of Ahadith are replete with this, that this is a major, major sign and a great uh, indication and proof of the Mahdi as well that Nabi Isa alayhi salam returns and is uh, uh, a great support for the Imam because he speaks in support of the Imam and he also becomes a mediator between the Christian groups and the Muslims. So we are told now that um, Jesus, peace be upon him, or Nabi Isa alayhi salam um, negotiates with the Christian groups he convinces them of his identity, and uh, through that discussion, a seven-year treaty is then signed between the Muslims and this group of Christians. However, we are told at the end of the seven years, and according to some narrations, within two years, um, this group from the West violates this treaty, and they raise an army against the Mahdi, alayhi salam. Now, some have believed, some scholars have understood this to believe, that this violation of the treaty will be because of the fact that Nabi Isa alayhi salam himself will be propagating the idea of Islam. And there are many, many riwayat, again, that you could understand symbolically, if you like, that says that when Isa alayhi salam returns, he will break the cross and kill the swine. There's a lot of this repeating in traditions. He will break the cross and kill the swine, break the cross. And what this means is that in the early days of Islam, these were two distinguishing attributes by which the Christians were famous. The fact that Muslims did not consume pork, and the Christians did. Um, and the fact that Muslim, uh, Christians believed that Jesus was crucified. So in saying that he will break the cross and kill the swine, the idea is to show that he will basically refute this and prove to the Christians 
that this that they have believed was not true that he was not never claimed to be the son of God that he was never crucified and that um, he never permitted them to eat from the flesh of uh, the swine or pork and the ulama who have researched this have said that perhaps because of his preaching and the large number of Christians who will change their faith and come into the fold of Islam understanding Islam and Deen as that one true monotheistic religion that was the original Islam that Adam and Nuh and Ibrahim and all the other Anbiya alayhim salam had preached they will come into the fold of that one religion that the Mahdi alayhi salam establishes as the religion of Allah the Deen al-Haqq liyudhahirahu ala al-Deen kulli and uh, because of this preaching, those who are obviously not um, happy about that large conversion and the way things are turning, they will raise an army against the Imam, and that army will also be a huge army in itself. In one tradition, we are told they will raise 80 flags. Each flag will, or each standard will have an army of 12,000. When you do the math of 80 times 12,000, you're close to 1 million. And so there's an army of about a million that now stands in opposition to the Imam. At this point, again, we are told from the riwayat that Nabi Isa alayhi salam will publicly declare that he is on the side of the Mahdi alayhi salam and that he will publicly pledge his allegiance to the Imam and pray behind him at Quds. And so we have these riwayat both in the books of the Shia and the Sunni where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad where he said to the Muslims, what will your condition be when your Imam is amongst you and Isa alayhi salam prays behind your Imam. In other words, he is a follower of your Imam. He is the ma'moom to your Imam. Um, and a massive war will then commence. And this will again extend from Akka to Antakya, from Damascus to Quds. And the Muslims, again, we are told in Riwayat, will have a clear victory over this as well. Because this is now a movement that will just keep snowballing and getting larger and larger. And yet, as we said yesterday, this is not even the real purpose for which the Imam is here. This is simply a cleaning or a cleansing or a sweeping of, of the, 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 the earth, if you like, in order to establish justice and peace and to establish a unified religion that is based on Tawheed before the real work begins that we shall talk about shortly. Now we are told then that the West or the Romans, which would then be Europe or whatever is left of the West and the Christian West, will then surrender to Nabi Isa alayhi salam and to the Mahdi alayhi salam. And the whole region as well will come into the fold of uh, Islam, which will be the new world order, if you like. Shortly thereafter, we are told that Nabi Isa alayhi salam will pass away. So he will, his demise happens in the lifetime of the Imam. And the Imam alayhi salam will lead the funeral for Nabi Isa alayhi salam. The Salatul Mayyit will be led by the Imam. His funeral will be publicized and made uh, so public that everyone in the world is able to see and hear so that no one may ever again dis ascribe divinity to him and say that he is not dead or that he is the son of God and so on and so forth. And then there are details to his funeral as well such as for example his shroud will be from a cloth that was stitched by his own mother uh, Siddiqat uh, Maryam alayhi salam and that he will be buried in Quds next to his mother or he will be buried in Medina next to uh, the messenger of Allah peace be on him and his family. Now once the world is then filled with this justice and peace and the prophecy of uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam then takes pass in which he says that the world will not come to an end until a man comes forth from my descendants whose name shall be my name yamla'ul arda qistan wa adlan kama mul'at dhulman wa jawra he will fill the earth with peace and equity as it had been filled with injustices and oppression this prophecy then takes uh, comes to pass and the whole planet is now based on one religion, one monotheistic understanding of worshipping only one God, ascribing no partner to him uh, with justice. And then this ayat of Quran that we have been reciting, huda wa dinil haq, he it is who sent his messenger with guidance and the religion of truth, 
that is also fulfilled. It prevails over all other forms of religions that have different forms of polytheism. Even if the polytheists are averse to this. In other words, there is no room for anyone uh, to believe in anything else then. Now, it is only after this that the real work of the Imam begins. And this is where it is most important that we um, position ourselves mentally and understand that what is it that the Imam has come to do. Because if it was simply a question of fighting battles and overcoming the enemy and establishing a government, and then after the Imam is gone, for example, everything goes back to how it was before, then it really hasn't achieved much. It is just a fleeting and a few years of peace. But there is a change that now takes place that changes how human beings work and think and behave, and that, that change is lasting and uh, forever. Materially, human beings will learn to, lea to live without fear and greed. If you look at the world we live in today, if you look at the economics, uh, the economics of today, you will find that from the stock markets to the banking system to how we do business, it is entirely based on fear and greed. And that uh, way of life where everything operates on the basis of fear and greed is what shackles human beings and stops them from going forward and becoming more than just the uh, uh, um, socio-political animal that people like to call human beings. The true potential and worth of human beings begin to show itself when human beings learn to live and to trade and to coexist and to work without being driven by fear or greed. So that is from the material side. From the politics side as well, the politics of how human beings live with today is about controlling each other, about dominating, about one group having a say in how other people uh, live or the values that one, the society has is controlled and promoted by one group or one political party. That changes as well so that only the uh, understanding of Allah is that which human beings live by. So spiritually then, human beings learn to live by removing all forms of shirk and all forms of polytheism and all empty rituals that prevent human beings from understanding and recognizing who Allah is and a true understanding of Tawheed. And this is beautifully demonstrated in Surah uh, An-Nur, which is chapter 24 of the Qur'an, verse 55, in which Allah declares, and that in itself is a prophecy and a proof of the coming of a Mahdi. And in this ayah, uh, chapter 24, verse 55, Allah says, وَعَدَ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مِنْكُمْ وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ Allah makes a promise to those amongst you who believe and do good. He makes a promise to you. لَيَسْتَخْلِفَنَّهُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ كَمَا اسْتَخْلَفَ الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِمْ He shall make you the rulers of the earth as he made those before you. وَلَيُمَكِّنَنَّ لَهُمْ دِينَهُمُ الَّذِي ارْتَضَى لَهُمْ and that he will establish for them the religion that he has chosen for them and that he is pleased with. And that he shall change for them after a state of fear, they shall know a state of tranquility and peace. They shall worship me and me alone and not associate anyone with me. And the ayat then uh, makes a conclusion. So this is a profound ayat where Allah says, I promise that I shall do this. And this will only happen, obviously, when such a personality is present to make that change uh, happen. And it doesn't happen by forcing people to worship Allah or to accept Islam. But it happens by broadening their understanding and showing them what is it that stops them from growing and what is the real message that all the Anbiya and Mursaleen and Naima came and stood for. We are told in a hadith that if you can think of every form of knowledge that human beings could possess as the letters of the alphabet, which are 27 in Arabic, then all the knowledge that human beings would have accumulated from the time of Adam salam until the coming of the Mahdi is the equivalent of two letters. So all the technology we know today, all the advancements that we have made in science, in the medical field, in space travel, in all the different technologies that we know today, it will not exceed two letters in comparison to 27, as far as human beings will progress. Keeping in mind that also the sciences that human beings have had at different stages was also promoted by the Ambiya. 
Human beings always came to a stage where they were not able to move forward unless the Anbiya pushed them forward and took them to the next level. For example, when Adam salam came to the earth, we know from the Quran that he was covering himself with the leaves of trees. It was Nabi Idris salam who invented the cloth and taught human beings how to stitch cloth. It was Nabi Idris salam who taught human beings how to write. And that took a huge advancement to human beings. By being able to write and preserve their history and knowledge, they were able to pass this from generation to generation. Then human beings came to their own land and they reached the cost of their land and they were not able to discover new land. It was Nuh alayhi salam through building of the ark that he introduced human beings to the art of building ships. So shipbuilding then took human beings to new levels of sciences and advancements. In fact, up until the Second World War, the common way of traveling was through ships, wasn't it? A lot of our grandparents will tell you when they went for Hajj and when they traveled, they traveled by ship. The British were superpowers before the United States because they ruled the seas, the British Empire. It was the United States that became superpowers because they were then able to show uh, uh, power, air power as opposed to power at the seas. So traveling by air is really not that old as it may appear to be. And you see these, for example, human beings worked with wood, for example, and stone. It was Dawood who introduced human beings to the art of melting iron because he had the miracle of melting iron, isn't it? We recite in du'as, Ya mulayyin al hadid li Dawood So when you look at all these things, you will find that from medicine to uh, technology, at different stages where human beings were not able to move forward, Allah through His prophets and messengers introduced human beings to different forms and different sciences such as Sulaiman and Dawood and so on and so forth. And along those same lines then, all the knowledge that human beings will have accumulated, even though they may not be showing gratefulness and acknowledging and paying tribute to these messengers and the fact that Allah has been giving them the ground and the means and the foundation to grow in their knowledge, this knowledge will stop at just two letters. The Mahdi salam will complete the knowledge of human beings. He will take human potential to new heights and add 25 letters to the two. So if you do the math and look at it from a percentage, it is astounding how far he will take human beings. And he will add it to those two and complete it to 27 letters. So this again tells us that it is perhaps beyond our imagination how far human beings would progress in science. And that is why then we should not be amazed or surprised when we see different riwayat that talk of things that appear fantastic to us. For example, we have riwayat to say that there are other planets where intelligent life forms exist. And the Mahdi salam will establish communication with those planets and those other uh, beings and allow human beings to communicate with them. Or the riwayat that say that human beings will be able to travel in space freely. Or for example, riwayat that say that the bringing back of the dead back to life will become a common thing. And that it will become very common for the dead to come back to life. Or the riwayat that say that some of the prophets and the anbiya will come back to life and they will rule on the earth for as long as Allah wishes. And the concept of raj'at, where the imams come back and so on and so forth. All salawat ala Muhammad wa all such narrations essentially show us that human beings will truly know what Allah had intended for them uh, with the coming of the Mahdi salam. Now there were certain things that I had discussed at great length last year on the same occasion. I will just mention in brief and in passing. How does the Imam eliminate this tendency to live by fear and greed. And in mentioning this again in passing, because it was discussed in detail last year, one of the things that is commonly shown in a hadith is that the Imam will bring forth the treasures from the earth. And he will give people so much that they will not have room to store all the treasures. He will announce to people and say, come and take as much as you want. So the world we live in today is we constantly seek more for ourselves. If we can get something after what we need, we collect more and we hoard, thinking we might need it in the future. So we are driven by greed. Supposing there was so much of what we need, so that there was no room to keep that, then at some point that thing would lose value, isn't it? If money is important to me, 
I could collect as much as I can take, but at some point if it just becomes a meaningless number, then there's no point in me asking for it. Or if it was in form of gold coins, and I could take so much that at some point I cannot store that gold in my house, and the streets are littered with it, then it would lose its value. So the Imam would take human beings to this point where after having initially human beings will react as they naturally do and they will come forth and take as much as they can. But when they realize that the wealth is not going anywhere and there is so much of it that people don't know what to do with it, then they will stop acting on greed and in fear. There will be no need for that anymore. Now the question that will arise after that is that what then would be the reason for human beings to earn a living, for example? Because today when we go and earn a living, we do so out of a need. And the examples we gave last year is to say, for example, if my job is to work at a gas station, for example, I get up early morning and work there because I need to earn a living to support my family. If someone's job is to collect the waste or the garbage, he does so because he needs to support his family. So we all get up early in the morning, we do this, we do that, we strive to earn a living. Supposing there was so much wealth that nobody knew what to do with it, then why would anybody go to work? Which means then that human beings would have to change how they think. They would have to come to a point where they learn how to go and work and serve humanity out of the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Human beings would have to learn to go and work and have a system continuing in place so that you do something to support me, I do something to support you in order to keep society functioning only out of the love of Allah and the creation and humanity. Not because I want something or I need something. And then there are many ahadith to talk about how life would then function along those lines and how the Imam would eliminate the common things that prevent human beings from progressing like illnesses and uh, um, uh, um, other forms of social ills. There is also a discussion about another uh, important sign in the books of Ahadith, and that is the sign of Dajjal. Now, with the discussion on Dajjal, it is very difficult to pinpoint when exactly this creature or person appears. Um, if you compare this with Christian eschatology, you will find a striking, a striking resemblance with the concept of the Antichrist. The Jal literally means one who deceives people. And in many books of Ahadith, he is called uh, Masih ad Dajjal. Masih being the Messiah, as in the Christ. So he is the deceiving Christ, if you like. So from the Christian books, they tend to compare Jesus with the Antichrist to show an individual who comes forth and who appears to be working for the good of humanity and bringing peace, but he actually has another agenda, which is to enslave human beings and then finally to claim divinity for himself. If you compare this to Islamic te texts, you will find a similar idea that an individual comes forth who somehow takes control of the economy. The words in a hadith literally say that he controls the food and the water, which actually would mean he controls the economy, and that he brings humanity to a point where they, are either, they either have to choose to submit to him in order to get that food and water, in order to survive, or if they oppose him, then they are killed or they face starvation. What is not clear though is at what point this Dajjal appears. Some scholars have understood that he appears long before the coming of the Imam. We know from riwayat, some traditions say that human beings have never been tested the way they will be tested with the coming of Dajjal. Some riwayat say that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Muhammad. He used to seek refuge with Allah from Dajjal. He used to take out a tasbih and saying, A'udhu billahi min fitnati Dajjal. I seek refuge with Allah from the mischief of Dajjal. Now, some of the ulama, however, believe that his coming actually happens after the coming of the Mahdi alayhi salam. And the way they position this is the reason why Dajjal's coming is so dangerous and the reason why he's able to mislead so many people is because of some of the... Uh, miracles, if you like, he performs to convince people of his own divinity that he is God. And these ulama who believe he comes after the Mahdi believe so on the basis that when this knowledge spreads, these 27 letters of knowledge, if you like, this individual who is, uh, uh, who is described simply as Dajjal, 
he has access to some of this knowledge that he misuses and because of that he is able to mislead a large number of people. And uh, we know from a hadith that he is defeated and he is killed either by the Mahdi salam or by Nabi Isa salam. And there are some riwayat that even pinpoint the place exactly where he is killed and so on and so forth. So there is a complete discussion on the Dajjal and then other um, uh, things that you hear of time and again is Yajuj and Majuj, uh, which in the Bible are described as Gog and Magog and so on. And those are all again lengthy discussions that would really make these three days only a discussion on signs and eschatology and so on and so forth. However, I wish to um, stop at this point discussing the signs and shift the discussion now to the second phase because I think in terms of understanding the sequence of events, this suffices, seeing from the time of the Imam declaring his return in Mecca near the Kaaba right to the time where he establishes peace and takes human beings to new heights and new levels of uh, understanding. So we now take our discussion to a, new, uh, to a different uh, phase and we now want to talk about what are the reasons that those who might hear of the coming of the Imam, uh, the reasons they might still oppose the Imam or reject him. If you can recite a salawat ala Muhammad wa ala. Now the reasons are many obviously and uh, I'm sure you can think of others yourself but I have some seven reasons that uh, we may not complete tonight and we will discuss the rest tomorrow whatever we don't finish uh, but these are more just to get us thinking along those lines and uh, there is also a reason why um, I thought it appropriate to discuss the reasons why people would reject him rather than to discuss the qualities for which people would accept him because a lot of times the truth cannot be described or understood in words. Uh, truth can be realized, it cannot be spoken of. Each individual must find the truth himself, must discover and journey and realize those truths themselves. Otherwise, those who are enlightened who came before us would simply write it in words, we would read them and become enlightened. You see that right from the basis on which Islam tries to explain the most fundamental concept which is God, it does not tell you who God is. It asks you to, when you wish to be a Muslim, all you do is you remove all others besides God. You start by saying, La ilaha, there is no other God, illallah. But to know Allah is not something that can be explained to you. Even if we were trying to understand who Allah is, it would be easier for me to talk about who is not Allah. So along those lines then, we are talking about what are the reasons for which people would reject the Imam and hopefully through that we would understand the opposite which is the reasons for which we might accept him. One of the reasons would be that initially when the Imam makes his uh, appearance and announces his coming back, people will come towards him seeking relief without realizing that this relief will not be immediate, there are sacrifices to be made. And there is suffering that must be uh, experienced and there is suffering involved before that peace and tranquility is established. In other words, the Imam doesn't come and then just, uh, uh, as I said yesterday, just wave a magic wand and everything is fine. The Imam comes to lead people, but the people must fight and struggle and strive and sacrifice to establish that with his guidance. If we try and draw a parallel of this to the previous Muslims in the early days of Islam, a very good example would be the Battle of Uhud. When you study the Battle of Uhud, you will see that prior to that, when the Muslims were suffering intensely, they were constantly praying to Allah for relief. And they were saying, why doesn't Allah give us permission to fight against the enemy? For 12 years, the Messenger of Allah preached in Mecca, and the Muslims were persecuted. And they kept praying to Allah, Oh Allah, give us permission to fight back. Give us permission to defend ourselves. Give us permission to fight in your way and achieve martyrdom. And they were not given this permission. When they were finally given that permission, very much after the first battle of Badr, in the battle of Uhud, most of them ran away. Which showed that what you say with the tongue is not necessarily what comes from the heart. And Allah in fact mentions this precise idea in Surah Ali Imran, chapter 3, verse 143, Allah says, وَلَقَدْ كُنْتُمْ تَمَنَّوْنَ الْمَوْتْ فَقَدْ رَأَيْتُمُوهُ 
It was you who used to yearn and long for death, so now surely you have seen it with your eyes. And that is the state that we find ourselves today, isn't it? We all pray, Allahumma ajjil farajahu, Allahumma ajjil farajahu. Oh Allah, hasten his reappearance. Oh Allah, human beings are suffering. Look at our brothers in Palestine. Look at our brothers here and there. When shall we get relief? Why doesn't the Imam return? We wish we could attain martyrdom and shahadat and so on. The point is, when it happens, the reaction might be different. And Allah says in same in Surah Al-Imran, in verse 167, that when the people who then had been praying for martyrdom, some of them who were hypocrites, when they were told, come now and fight in the way of God, they said, if we knew there was fighting, we would not have become Muslims. This is verse 167. You can go read it for yourself, chapter 3. If we knew there was fighting, we would not have become Muslims. Now Allah responds to that. He says, on the day when they said this, they were closer to kufr than they were to iman. They were closer to being faithless than to be faithful. And so this is one reason that in seeking relief, we must not expect that it will be easy. We must be willing to really, uh, as we say, walk the talk. The other reason that human beings might uh, not uh, accept the imam or join him when they should, is that by the time he returns, they will have seen so much strife and war and turmoil that many of them will become fed up with the whole idea of striving anymore or fighting or going to war, even if it is for the sake of God. In fact, many will have reached a point where they will be seeking relief through death. They will be praying to Allah for death rather than wanting to go and fight anymore. And they will not realize that this is different. Now, just to give you a very quick idea of some of the things that happened before the Imam comes, even though we've talked about the signs. We said yesterday and previously as well that sin and immorality would be widespread before the coming of the Imam. Atheism, flying in the face of God, denying the existence of God will be open and blasphemy will not even be considered blasphemy. People will either stop believing in God altogether or will change religion to such a degree to suit their own beliefs that it will not even be the original Islam. Large groups of individuals, including Muslims, will become like straws in the wind, where any caller who calls them to anything, they will believe in it. Today, one calls them this way, they go this way. Tomorrow, somebody calls them that way, they'll go that way. There will be no basis and criteria to identify what is haq from what is batil, what is truth from what is falsehood. And this may be perhaps because of abandoning the Quran or because of uh, not continuing to maintain respect and acknowledging the ulama, whatever the reason might be. We know also from a hadith that before the coming of the Imam, the Muslims will be oppressed across the world, and many Muslim lands will be taken over by non-Muslims and by their enemies. They will either be overthrown or they will be ruled behind the scenes by others as puppets. In particular, the ahadith mention Palestine, and they talk of the fitna of Philistine, which is very interesting because these riwayats are 1,200 and 1,400 years old. But there is a repeated mention of Palestine as being under constant strife and being taken by the enemies of Islam. So the fitna of Philistine is mentioned again and again in riwayats. Um, and the fact that Muslims will not only be killed by their enemies, but they will kill themselves, uh, each other as well. There will be wars between the Turks and the Romans. There will be wars that will cover the Muslim nations. The Arabs will fight one another. One of the signs we mentioned last year as well was that in one riwayat it says that before the coming of the Mahdi, two-thirds of the human population will be wiped out. Now granted, this is not one of those definite signs like the voice that is heard in the heavens and the killing of Nafsu Zakia and the uh, landslide at Baida and the Khurasani and Yamani and Sufiani. It isn't listed with those definite signs, but it is mentioned quite a bit in the books. So whether it happens like that or does not happen for any other reason, we don't know. But it is described very graphically by Imam Jafar al-Sadiq sallallahu wa sallamu alayhi Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad ala Muhammad He says there will be three, there will be a white death and a red death. The white death will kill one third of the human population, the red death will kill one third of the human population. When he was asked what this is, he said the white death will be death through hunger and drought and plague and disease and so on and so forth through epidemics and pandemics and so on. 
The red death will be, so the white death in part will also be through natural disasters. And the red death will be through war and through fighting and through killing and through murder, the red symbolizing blood. And by the time nations have fought nations, they, there will be no superpower because everybody will be so weak. And in part, that war might also bring about disease. And this is a significant number of the human population. I mean, today when you talk of, uh, you know, bird flu and med cow and swine flu, even those who talk of pandemics, they're, not, they're talking of millions dying or hundreds of millions dying. They're not talking of billions dying. We're talking, if this were to happen today, that in a population of six, seven billion, we're talking of two billion people dying of disease or drought or hunger or natural disasters, and another two billion dying of war. So this would have to be war that is on a global scale, catastrophic, like a third or a fourth world war. And so keeping all this in mind, this is a reason why people might reject the imam, being fed up and having, because life will not necessarily be the way we see it today when the imam comes. We may not even have jobs to be going to. We might all be in regions that are torn by war or disease or in curfews, for example. In one riwayat from Imam Muhammad al-Baqir, salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad wa Muhammad. He says, the one who will rise will not rise except in a condition of severe fearfulness and turmoil and mischief and afflictions that will cover human beings. Before that there will be pestilence and there will be disease and there will be droughts and the Arabs will fight amongst themselves and people will disagree and fight amongst themselves constantly. Their condition will change until people will pray for death to Allah day and night. They will see unbelievable changes in human beings, in how they behave and how they live, and how some of them will be eating others. Now, how some of them will eat others can be interpreted in two ways. Some have interpreted it symbolically to say how some will take complete and shamelessly take advantage of others just to survive, the whole survival of the fittest theory. The other is a more literal interpretation to say that starvation will reach such a point that human beings will become cannibals in some places and will literally eat human flesh to survive. And there are riwayats, there is some narrations to say that before the Qa'im returns, there will be a year of severe hunger and a lot of fear amongst human beings. And this state of fear and hunger will continue until the voice that is heard on the 23rd night of Ramadan that we spoke about yesterday. There are some riwayat that says that hunger will reach to such an extent that a man will sell his daughter for a loaf of bread. And uh, do not be surprised by this because I remember a couple of months back reading on one of the news, respected news uh, uh, sources, that in places like India, this is happening today. There are families who are confessing to having sold their daughters to people for $100, $200. So we're talking of global starvation and hunger. And this is just before the coming of the Imam. So this is a second major reason that mentally we need to really change how we think the world will be. It won't necessarily be the way we see it today. Our lives might change, our values might change. We may not behave as human beings, as civil human beings, so that when the Imam returns, it would not be surprising that large numbers of people would be so fed up with even the idea of responding to someone who is calling them to more fighting and more war and establishing peace and justice because they've heard this over and over again and been disappointed. Every government that comes talks about promising peace and tranquility and eliminating poverty and hunger and nobody does anything. So there will be people who will have lost that confidence at all. Okay, now we will talk about towards the end, maybe tomorrow, on what then is the way to prepare and be sure of uh, identifying and, and uh, responding to the Imam. So this is the second reason, being fed up with, with the idea of struggling anymore. A third reason that might uh, uh, take a little bit of time to explain, but I think nonetheless is very, very important to discuss, is a complete dependency on miracles. There are a large number of individuals amongst the Muslims who have this concept and idea that the only way to identify the true Imam is through miracles. This is not to say that the Imam is incapable of performing miracles or that he will not perform them. 
But it is very, very important that we understand for ourselves and we train our children to understand as well that when you wish to prove something as being true or false, you do not do it on the basis of miracles. Now, I wish to just talk about this concept of what role does a miracle play and can you really prove anything with a physical sign or a miracle, just for a bit, with evidence from the Qur'an. We see, for example, uh, the previous generations um, who expected miracles to happen for the sake of truth. In the Battle of Uhud, the same Surah Ali Imran, there were groups of people who expected that because we are with the Messenger of Allah, we can only win. There has to be victory for us. So when they f suffered losses because of their own greed at the Battle of Uhud, one of the things some of them said was, had this Prophet been the real Prophet, and had this religion been the true religion, we would not have been killed the way we were killed. To which the Qur'an says that Allah kept His promise, but it was you who broke your side of the bargain by being greedy for the spoils of war. Avert death from yourself if you are truthful. This is chapter 3 verse 154. Okay. So the Qur'an is very clear that don't expect miracles for successes. Allah expects you as human beings to struggle for the truth and establish it, not through miracles. If we go even further back and look at the previous prophets and how their people behaved, look at for example the Jews to whom the Prophet Musa السلام, was sent. They saw some astounding miracles which we can perhaps not even imagine to ever see in our lifetime. Take for example the miracle they saw of a staff being changed into a serpent. Or take for example the miracle of the parting of the sea. Can you imagine, many of you may have seen a sea or an ocean, I know there are some who have never leave, lived, uh, lived out, uh, out of Ontario and they've never seen anything but a lake, but I'm sure you have seen an ocean even on television. And if you're standing at the shores of an ocean and the sea begins to part in front of your eyes and you're walking on the seabed now and there are walls of water besides you that rise up like mountains and you walk across this, what more would you want than this as evidence? Yet, after having seen this miracle, they still went and worshipped a calf. And they turned away from God. So, this is the first glimpse that makes us wonder, can physical signs really give you concluding evidence and a conviction that will never make you turn away from the truth? And there is an interesting incident that's narrated in Nahjul Balagha that during the Khilafat of Amirul Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad A Jew came to the Imam and he tried to mock Islam in the presence of the Imam. He said to him, O oh Ali, you Muslims, your Prophet died, you had not even buried him when you started fighting amongst yourselves. That was his argument. The reply of the Imam, astounding and beautiful, because when it comes to defending Islam, Imam Ali does not take, as most of us would do, most of us would have said, actually it was my right, but they didn't give me my right, and so on and so forth. He's defending Islam. Look at the answer he gives. He says, we argued about who should succeed our Prophet, but we did not argue about the message that our Prophet brought. Whereas you Jews, the mud in your sandals after walking across the ocean had not even dried when you said to your Prophet, make for us a God to worship like these idol worshippers have a God. And this is in the Quran where Allah says in Surah Al-A'raf, chapter 7, verse 138, قَالُوا يَا مُوسَىٰ إِجْعَلْ لَنَا إِلَٰهًا كَمَا لَهُمْ آلِهَةً As soon as they crossed the sea, they saw a group of people worshipping an idol. They said, Oh Moses, make for us an idol so that we too may worship it like they worship. And he said to them, Surely you are an ignorant people. So that in itself was an astounding miracle, but it still did not stop them. And then after that he goes up the mountain for 40 days to bring the commandments, and they still build a calf of their own out of gold, and they start worshipping it. So if you believe that miracles will bring conviction, then there is a serious uh, 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 misjudgment there. In Surah An-Nisa, chapter 4, verse 153, Allah says, The people of the book, the Ahlul Kitab, they say to you, 
that if you are true in your claim, cause a book to descend from the heavens. O oh Muhammad, if you are true, make a book come down from the heavens. And then Allah says to the Prophet, He says, and yet, they asked Musa for even greater than this. They said to Musa, show us Allah so that we may see him with our naked eyes. أَرِنَ اللَّهَ جَهْرَةً ثُمَّ اتَّخَذُوا الْعِجْلَ مِن بَعْدِ مَا جَاءَتُهُمُ الْبَيِّنَةً And then they took to worshipping a calf after they had seen clear signs. So despite all that signs, he took them up the mountain. They said, we want to see Allah. They were told, look at this mountain. If it stands in its place, you will see me. The mountain shatters. They faint. They die. They're brought back to life. They still go and worship a calf. So you're talking of physical signs and miracles. Then Musa alayhi salam brings them to the promised land before they wander the desert for 40 years. He tells them, in this land, there are an oppressive people that you must go and fight. They look inside, they see that these people are very big. Inna fiha qawman jabbarin. So they say to Musa, we are not going to fight. Now they say to him, O oh Musa, go you and your Lord and fight them. We are sitting here. Come when you are done, we will go. The Quran. Surah Al-Ma'idah, chapter 5, verse 24. فَذْهَبْ أَنْتَ وَرَبُّكْ فَقَاتِلَ إِنَّ هَا هُنَا قَائِدُونَ Go you and your Lord fight. We are sitting here. And you can relate to that, that it is easy for everyone to say, Oh Allah, send us the Mahdi, Oh Allah, send us the Mahdi. But when he comes, there will be people who will say, let's walk slowly behind. There are all these strong young men who can fight, let them do the work and then we'll catch up. This was the idea. And because of that, they were punished. They wandered the desert for 40 years. They were not allowed to go into that promised land. Then we have other uh, um, signs that people demand from our Prophet, from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. If you look at Surah Bani Israel, which is chapter 17, from verse 90 to 95, it is very, very interesting because you see that the, the, the Quraysh, they challenged the Prophet to say, if you want us to believe in you, we want certain signs from you. Now they are thinking with their little minds as desert people who, to whom water is precious and so on. So if you read these verses, in the interest of time, I will not actually go through the verses in detail. But they challenged the Prophet and they said things to him like, if you are a real Prophet, then cause a river to flow right here in front of us. Or if you are a real Prophet, then make an orchard to appear of dead palms and grapes and there should be a river running beneath, between it. And then they let their imagination fly and then they say, oh wait, wait, this is a better one. Okay? If you are a real prophet, then uh, we want to see you ascending towards the heavens. And if you ascend, we will not believe in you. When you come down, you must bring a book with you in your hands that we can read, naqra'uhu. Never mind the fact that they couldn't read. But bring a book down with you that we can read. Or they said to him, make for us a house that is made of pure gold, then we will believe in you. Or cause some fragments of the heavens to break and we should see the sky falling down in little pieces from the sky, then we will believe in you. you see? So they bring all these arguments and challenges just to be... Uh, uh, argumentative for the sake of it but they were not going to believe in it because when you then look at it further uh, uh, where Allah talks about um, this response to this he says we showed people signs like these and greater than these in the past but they denied them and in the same surah uh, Bani Israel chapter 17 in verse 59 Allah says وَمَا مَنَعَنَا أَن نُرْسِلَ بِالْآيَاتِ إِلَّا أَن كَذَّبَ بِهَا الْأَوَّلُونَ And nothing stops us from bringing all the signs that they want. Except for obviously the ridiculous ones like bring Allah down and we should look at Him and the angels and we should look at them and so on. Because Allah is not in a fixed location to be brought down and looked at. But He says we could have brought all the signs that they want. Nothing prevents us except that when we did this in the past generations, they denied them. وَآتَيْنَا الثَّمُودَ نَاقَةً مُبْصِرَةً فَذَلَمُوا بِهَا We brought to the people of Thamud a camel 
it was brought from a carving on a cave and it was brought to life. A real camel came out of the wall to them. And yet they slaughtered and hamstrung the camel and killed it. We do not send miracles and signs except as a deterrent to people. So that then tells us that miracles have a certain purpose uh, in Allah's eyes. The idea of a miracle is not to provide proof, if I can put it that way, but to provide added proof. Meaning that the miracle only shows you that this prophet or this messenger or this imam has a special position with Allah such that when he asks Allah for something, his prayer is not refused. But it does not in itself give you a conviction that will not leave you or eliminate hypocrisy from the heart. It is also used as a deterrent, as the Quran says, so that those who are evil are held back because they realize that if this person prays for something, it will affect us. Such as Fir'aun, for example, when the Prophet Musa salam prays for pestilence, for locusts, and for the firstborn in all the Egyptian family to die, all these things happen. So it serves as a deterrent to them. But in itself, it is not meant to bring human beings to prove. Why? Because Allah does not want human beings to be convinced of the truth only by miracles and signs. There is no greatness in that. Greatness lies in attaining conviction through purifying oneself, through realization, through the intellect, through understanding, rather than just miracles, where one may then argue, well, I was hypnotized, or well, there was a scientific explanation to this, or well, I don't know if it really happened, or well, it happened a thousand years ago, I want to see that for myself. And that is why we argue that the greatest miracle is the Qur'an. Even though the Messenger of Allah performed many other miracles. A lot of times you will find, if you look at the internet as well, you will see Christians will argue on this basis. They will say, oh Jesus was better than Muhammad because Jesus could bring the dead back to life, he could heal the lepers, he could give the blind sight, he could do this, he could do that. What could your prophet do? Right? And then we argue back and say, well, he split the moon and when he holds pebbles in his hands, they would do tasbih and a tree moved from its place. And Now these were true. The Prophet did do those. But that is not the line of argument. Because when Jesus himself came and he performed these miracles, the people denied him. Most of them denied him, except the Hawariyun or the disciples. He took clay and built a bird out of that and fashioned it. And with the permission of Allah, he would breathe life into it and it would fly and become a living creature. They would still deny it and say, this is magic. So he had to perform miracles to involve them in the miracle. He said to them, I will tell you what you have in your homes and what you store. And I will tell you what you will eat tomorrow. So that they can see that they also are a part of that miracle and it isn't magic or tricks being played on their eyes. So this in itself is not... Uh, 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 proof and what I wish to do tonight inshallah just to uh, sort of wrap up on this r third reason as to why people would reject the Imam that total reliance on just physical signs and miracles is to say that if miracles are shown to a heart that is impure instead of adding conviction to it it will actually add opposition to the truth there is a verse of the Quran where Allah says, "Fi qulubihim maradun, fazadahumullahu marada." In their hearts is a disease, and Allah increases the disease in their hearts. Now, how does Allah increase disease in the heart of someone? It goes against the idea of a God who is just and kind and loving, who wishes well for his creation and wishes to guide them, isn't it? Allah wishes to guide human beings. Why would he put disease? Somebody has disease in his heart, Allah should help it come out. He shouldn't be adding disease to it. He says, in their heart is a disease. Allah increases disease in their heart. Now, if you... Look at this verse and study it, and look at what the Mufassirin have to say about it. They say that the disease that is increased in their hearts by Allah is by being shown more signs. Their hearts are impure. So Allah shows them sign after sign after sign, miracle after miracle after miracle, proof after proof after proof. That is how disease increases in their hearts. The more they are shown, the more opposed they become to the truth. And this is the meaning of فَزَادَهُمُ اللَّهُ marada. And that is why again, in many verses of the Qur'an, Allah also says this, that 
they say, why does not Allah send an angel down from the heavens? In that Surah Bani Israel, after you go to verse 90 to 95, if you go a little further, there is a verse where Allah says that nothing has stopped people from accepting the truth in the past, except that they have said, Allahu Basharan Rasulah. Does Allah send an ordinary human being as a messenger? This idea that somebody who looks like us in flesh and blood could be a messenger from God, sounded very, very unbelievable to people. And this is the root cause, Allah says, that they would deny the truth. Now Allah says in one verse of the Quran, that they say, why does not Allah send angels down? He says, if angels were living on the earth, we would have sent angels as messengers. But human beings live on the earth, so Allah sends human beings. And that was why yesterday as well, when we talked about the signs of the Imams, we repeatedly said that we want to see the ordinariness and the humanness in the events that take place in the coming of the Mahdi and the establishment of a world Islamic uh, uh, utopia, if you like, where there is peace and tranquility, where human beings progress to new heights and to new growths of understanding. This happens through sacrifices, through the normal processes of cause and effect that we know today. Through our participation, through our sacrifices, through our sincerity, through our willingness to surrender and to accept the truth. Not through miracles and through signs, because there is no greatness in that. So to summarize then, we have mentioned three signs. We have said that one of the reasons people would reject the Imam is that their initial reaction would be to seek relief without realizing there is sacrifices to be made. And once they realize there is sacrifices, they would turn against the Imam. The second would be not wanting to participate because of being fed up with the conditions of the time by the time the Imam returns. And the third is this complete dependency on miracles only and expecting that the Imam is proven to be the Imam only by showing us miracles. Uh, there are signs that the Imam does show, but we shall talk of the other signs inshallah tomorrow and complete this subject. Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala ali baytihi tayyibin al-tahirin. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to hasten the appearance of our Imam. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to increase us in our understanding of our Imam. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us prepare for him not just physically, but also spiritually so that inshallah when he returns we are not of those who reject him. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bihaqti Muhammad wa ali Muhammad and for the sake of our Imam on these auspicious nights that Allah should give health and shifa to those who are ill and he should grant maghfirah to those who have passed away. Rabbana taqabbal minna innaka anta sami'ul alim. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين بارئ الخلائق أجمعين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا وحبيب قلوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا وشفيع ذنوبنا أبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على ثم الصلاة والسلام على آل به الطيبين الطاهرين الميامين لا سيما إمام زماننا هذا الحجة ابن الحسن صلوات الله وسلامه عليه الله صل على محمد أما بعد فقد قال الله تبارك وتعالى في كتابه بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم هو الذي أرسل رسوله بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله ولو كره المشركون صلوات الله محمد وعلى اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد Tonight is our third and final discussion on the coming of the Mahdi may Allah hasten his appearance and uh, as we all know that uh, tonight as well after Maghrib we mark the 15th night of Sha'ban uh, where we also commemorate the birth and the coming of the Imam of our time. So inshallah, what we would like to do is complete our topic that we have been discussing for the last uh, two nights. And uh, thereafter, inshallah, we will talk about uh, the importance of this night as well as uh, um, 
specifically about the imam uh, for the benefit of uh, the youth and the children as well. Um, up until yesterday, we had begun discussing the reasons for which individuals might reject the imam despite having waited for him all their lives. And we gave a number of reasons. And the third reason at which we stopped was that there will be individuals who will completely rely on physical signs and miracles to prove their uh, to prove uh, the imam's uh, validity. And that will be their um, uh, shortfall, essentially. And uh, one of uh, my dear brothers as well mentioned to me uh, last night that there is a khutbah or a sermon in Nahjul Balagha in which uh, Imam Ali alayhi salam discusses the very same uh, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad discusses the very same point about why um, Allah did not give his messengers all the miracles that people asked for. Uh, you will recall last night we mentioned that Surah Bani Israel chapter 17 verse 90 to 95 the mushrikeen or the polytheists of Mecca demanded from the Prophet that before we accept you, you must show us all these signs. You must bring a house of gold and you must show us an orchard of grapes and date palms and you must cause a river to gush beneath our feet and so on and so forth and you must ascend the heavens. Um, and uh, these uh, uh, Signs Allah, of course, addresses them. We said yesterday where Allah says that we have shown many signs to people in the past, but they simply rejected it. So we show miracles only as a deterrent, only as an added proof, only to prevent the evildoers. Uh, but it is not our intention to uh, use those primarily as proofs. And Imam Ali alayhi salam in this sermon 192, which is known as Khutbatul Qasiyah, um, he says... Uh, with a different reason, he says, had Allah wished, he could have given all these signs to his prophets. He could have given them the ability to create these houses of gold and ascend the heavens and so on and so forth. But then it would negate the whole idea of being rewarded for good or being punished for evil. In other words, what the Imam is saying is, even if it can be um, believed that physical signs would suffice as proofs, assuming that the people of Musa and others denied, but our generation would have accepted the signs, it would still be a problem because those who are rewarded to a large extent are rewarded on the day of judgment for their belief in the unseen. Allah, of course, does not have a physical form. But if everyone could see the Malakut, the kingdom of the heavens, and could see the angels, and if people could see paradise and hell, and if people could see how every time they perform an action, good or evil, it manifests itself physically in form of a reward or punishment, then no one would perform anything evil. Everybody would strive to do good day and night because there would be a direct evidence and proof of their actions immediately. But a large degree of the reward on the day of judgment lies in the fact that you believe in the unseen. In fact, the Quran begins with that. Alif Lam Mim in Surah Al-Baqarah, ذَلِكَ الْكِتَابُ لَا رَيْبَ فِي هُدًا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ الَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِالْغَيْبِ Those who believe in the unseen. It is part and parcel of having faith that you believe in the uh, unseen. And that's why you see the Quran uh, is revealed from Allah, but Allah is unseen. Uh, the angels are unseen. The paradise and hell are, is, is unseen. Uh, for most Muslims through the ages, they never saw the Prophet. So those are, that is unseen to them. And for our generation, the Imam is unseen as well. And the more one has believed based on reasoning and faith and not on uh, mushahada or witnessing with the eye, the greater the reward. Um, so Imam Ali alayhi salam says in that khutbah 192 that Allah could have also made his prophets such that they would have overcome their enemies with force. They would have some sort of superpowers by which they would cause anyone who stands in their way to be weakened and humbled and overcome. But that would also negate the idea of the world being a trial and a test and the whole idea of being rewarded and punished. So he said he made his messengers and prophets individuals of very strong determination, but he made them physically appear to be weak. He made them physically appear to be human, flesh and blood, 
the kind that you could fight and overcome. And he kept their true uh, spiritual uh, ability or nur or power hidden and latent as opposed to uh, visible. So that uh, sort of is an added textual evidence or evidence from hadith that miracles alone will not suffice uh, and, and is not intended to be proof uh, for one who wants to verify anything. Now, we continue then from, uh, from yesterday's discussion on, on uh, this third reason, miracles, and we bring the fourth reason. The fourth reason is that some individuals who perhaps see themselves as being intellectuals, they will depend entirely on logic and intellect alone. And logic and intellect alone is also not sufficient um, to prove much. We know, for example, that our main concern and debate with atheists when it comes to proving the existence of God is precisely this, that the atheist wants to depend only on the mind to prove the existence of God. The mind, however, is not able, as we have said time and again, to know anything directly. The mind depends on the five senses. So the mind depends on what the eyes will transmit to it, or what the ears will transmit to it, or what the tongue will transmit to it, or what the nose will transmit, or what the skin, the sense of touch and sound and sight and so on and so forth. But the eyes itself, as a piece of jelly only, will only capture certain lights. There could be beings in this room who have a certain light or a frequency that the eye is not able to capture. And because the eye is not able to capture it, the mind cannot prove it. There may be sounds of certain frequencies that the human ear, the bones and whatever work causes sound to travel through the ears, is not able to be captured by the human ear. Therefore, the mind has no experience of those sounds. That does not mean those frequencies do not exist. So, relying on simply logic and argument and intellectual proof can also be a hindrance to realizing who the Imam is. So there is a bit of both. There is the aspect of the miracles, not that the Imam will not perform miracle. There is the intellect that plays a role. Aql in itself has been acknowledged as a source of knowing God as well, as a hujja, as a proof, and therefore a source of knowing an Imam as well. But alone it will not suffice. And that is why you see philosophers after thousands of years they have still not concluded does God exist or not. They continue debating and arguing, and they never will conclude. And I don't think they intend to in any case. It's just uh, a going back and forth of uh, the mind producing proofs and counter proofs. So added to the complexity of relying on the intellect alone as being limited in the five senses, the media as well can steer individuals' thoughts and intellects um, as we have seen time and again, Salat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad, Muhammad. We know these and people who have studied marketing and psychology, they will tell you how um, the, the ads you watch on TV and what you see on the newspapers and the billboards you see, they're all targeted to cause you to think in a particular manner or to influence your values and your thoughts. So in similar vein, we have riwayat and ahadith to say that even after a voice is heard from the heavens announcing the coming of the imam, there will be attempts to try and explain things away, as we have said in the past, either using quote-unquote science or using some form of media to say, well, this was not what you think, it was something else, and so on and so forth. Or, for example, the whole issue of the dukhan, the smoke that envelops the whole world. There is a whole surah of Qur'an, surah to dukhan which talks about a sign that is to come um, as a warning to mankind. And uh, again, you will see when you read about that, that when it will come for a while, people will repent, turn towards Allah, but then again they will turn to sin because they will explain it away in some form or the other. And this is not something new. This has happened time and time again. Um, I remember recently seeing uh, um, an article by um, a scientist, if you like, trying to explain the parting of the sea for Musa alayhi salam. And he was desperately trying to show that at the time that Musa went to the shores of the sea, right at that point there was a tsunami and the, you know, the waves and the earthquake and the whole thing split open and he just crossed in time and the, you know. So everybody will try and explain. I've seen articles as well by individuals who are opposed to Christianity saying that 
the miracle of Jesus walking on water was not really a great miracle because at the time that he was near the sea that he walked on, um, it was winter time, and that particular year there was a lot of frost, and there were some thin sheets of ice floating on the sea. So he was actually standing on a sheet of ice. He wasn't actually walking on water. Okay. So people will try and explain things away. Never mind the fact that why it would happen at exactly that time when a miracle is happening. Now if Allah causes certain natural phenomena and signs to come together in order for the miracle to manifest itself, that does not mean it is not from Allah. So if you can prove, for example, that the world came into existence with a big bang, that does not mean that Allah did not cause the big bang. So uh, science and intellect can be proof, but is not necessarily conclusive proof. So this is another reason yet by which humans might reject um, the, the uh, coming of an imam. Now, we come to a fifth reason, which is um, a little more sensitive, and I... Um, um, urge us to listen to this and take it in the, with the intention that it was meant to be. And this is the matter of hypocrisy. A lot of times individuals may suffer from a form of hypocrisy without realizing that. And this comes from wanting peace and bliss and justice for oneself but not necessarily for others. And often the question is asked, how do we come closer to our Imam or how do we build a relationship with our Imam or how do we get to know the Imam better or how do we personalize that relationship with him and this can be answered in many ways but one way is in aligning our values and our character to his not waiting that when he comes and establishes a system of justice then we will live by justice we need to learn to say that what will the world look like when he comes can I start living like that to the degree that I can? Right? There may be things that are beyond our ability, but there may be things that are within our ability. As an example, time and again I have heard individuals from the Muslim community, unfortunately, who will boast of how well they have done in business and how they sold things at 200% profit or 300% profit or 500% profit. And there is a need to ask ourselves, are these the values by which the Imam lives by? If these are the things that we take pride in, that I got this for $50 but I was able to sell it for $300, are we going to be able to live in a system where this is not permitted? And what would our reaction be if we were taken to task or punished for having done such a thing? You see, so we want justice and good and wealth and bliss and comfort for ourselves, but sometimes we neglect that aspect that we are not able to live in a society where justice has to prevail for everyone. This may be also in other forms. You may have been to places and countries where you will find Muslims cheating others. Uh, not necessarily Muslims only, it happens all over the world, but our concern is primarily first as Muslims because it should not be expected of a Muslim. It could be understood of someone who does not believe in God, but certainly not of a Muslim. So you may come across societies, not necessarily here, where individuals who call themselves Muslims show a lack of integrity. They might overcharge you when they give you a ride in the taxi. They might overcharge you because you don't know the language or because you don't speak that language or they know you're a tourist, for example. Now, such individuals, they also pray, Allahumma ajil farajahu, oh Allah, hasten the appearance of the Imam. They celebrate the 15th of Sha'ban. But will they be able to survive in a system where they cannot cheat people? See, so these are things that uh, um, need to be thought about, that we don't change to a new leaf and develop 100% integrity overnight when the Imam comes. It is something we have or we don't have. As we have said before, we cannot have 99% integrity or 99.9% .9 integrity. We either have it or we don't. And if we cannot be just today with ourselves, with our families, with our community, and if we continue fighting, arguing over little things, petty things, holding grudges, not, we should not being willing to forgive each other for mistakes that we ourselves have made in the past, then we should at least, at the very least, acknowledge that we would not be able to live very easily in a society where there is no room for individuals um, who behave like that. Then there may be things 
as I said, petty things, backbiting, speaking ill of each other, and so on and so forth. There may be things that are around us in society that we are used to, but in our hearts we should be averse to them. We should not be acknowledging them and accepting them. For example, there is the system of interest. Now, I do not wish to discuss the fiqh laws and masail of taking interest and so on, and the banking system, and what the ulama have to say, and so on and so forth. But overall we know that the system of, in, of interest is one that is meant to enslave people and to make the rich richer and the poor poorer. Now we may have to live with that sort of a system under certain circumstances and we might even have certain allowances from the maraje in the present time we live in. But that does not mean that in our hearts we love that system. Because when the imam comes that system will be abolished for sure. So now, can we live in a society where we earn a living, but we don't earn interest? For many, this would be very hard to accept. It may be easy to speak about it. But this is what I mean. There is pros and cons to living in a society that is not primarily a Muslim society. The advantages of living in a society such as ours in the West is that you are able to clearly see religion from culture if you choose to do so. Many individuals who come from the East or who live in societies that are predominantly Muslim, when you visit them, when you talk to them, when you see how they live, you find that they have confused culture and Islam. And a lot of times they're not able to distinguish one from the other. Nor do they take religion as something precious. They take it for granted because it is all around. They do not, for example, take a lot of pain to raise their children with Islamic teachings or bring them to the madrasa because if I don't raise my child, my neighbor will raise my child. Mahalla is there, there's somebody other, there's a mosque in every corner, the child will grow up as a good Muslim. A lot of times these individuals when they come here, they are overwhelmed and they stop praying, they stop fasting and so on and so forth. We've all heard of such uh, horror stories. But the disadvantage of living in a society that is not predominantly Muslim as well, is that you grow up seeing things that desensitize us so that we no longer see what is wrong as wrong. For example, if from the time I was born, Everywhere I grew, I saw every corner there was a beer store, just as an example. I am desensitized to the idea that alcohol is bad. I may not drink or consume alcohol as a Muslim, but nonetheless it is something that I do not feel repulsed by, because I am used to seeing that. Right? All the time on the televisions, the advertisements at the grocery stores where they may sell it and so on and so forth. So then when the Imam comes, these things are eliminated. Not that we would miss them, but this is just one example amongst many. Or for example, the fact that you grow up in a society where predominantly when you walk around in society, you don't see hijab being observed, because the majority are not Muslims. Now you live in a society where predominantly everyone is in hijab. That might be, so to speak, a cultural shock to many individuals. And so living in an Islamic society is a little different uh, and we need to love Islam and what it stands for and understand the philosophy behind its values in order to accept living in such a society. For example, in a true Islamic society with the Imam uh, uh, in, in, in control of the, the global Muslim society, there may be a system where everywhere there is congregational prayers being held, there is Friday prayers being held. Now we need and we have to attend those Friday prayers. Even the individuals who say Jum'a prayers is not wajib, they say it's wajib in the presence of the Imam. But if all our lives we are against praying Jamaat prayers, we are against praying Friday prayers, then how would we adjust in such a society? If we cannot look beyond fighting and arguing over little things like you know, is this music allowed or is that music not allowed? Can I eat from here? Can I not eat from there? Why is hijab wajib? Why is it not? Then it would certainly be very difficult for us to exist in a society where not only Islamic values are upheld but enforced, where the system in the court of reward and punishment of justice is the Islamic hudud. You see, when it comes to the same issue of living in a society where the society drums into us certain ideas that these are old-fashioned and barbaric. Islam has its own philosophy, for example, where it upholds capital punishment or death sentence for certain sins and crimes, such as, for example, adultery or murder. Now, we live in a society where there is no capital punishment. If we suddenly had to live in a society where this is enforced, 
There are many individuals who all their lives prayed for the Imam without thinking of these things because subliminally they always believed that these were barbaric and these were things that were not acceptable. That this was old, that this had to change. The Imam cannot change the Sharia of Muhammad because the halal of Muhammad remains halal ila yawm al qiyamah and the haram of Muhammad remains haram ila yawm al qiyamah. Salawat ala Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. So today we have some leeway where I can sit with you and argue, well, your mujtahid says this, but my mujtahid says that. But when there is only one imam, the opinion will be only one. Therefore, everybody will do only that which he says. So, it is not that the imam wishes to enforce in the sense of a military regime or an oppressive regime. It is an imam who is ra'uf and rahim, who is kind and compassionate, who loves humanity and the creatures of God. He is an imam who is groomed to establish peace and justice on the earth. But we in turn must understand those values. We must take the time to study them and understand the philosophy behind them. In other words, we need to go from a position of simply following Sharia out of a sense of guilt or enforced or fear of hell to a point where we love Islam, where we cannot wait for him to come so that we can live in a society where true Islamic values are held. And that needs a certain change in thinking for some, not necessarily for all of us, but certainly for individuals like myself. So, if we continue striving then for purity, for spirituality, for a higher understanding of Islam, then obviously we have nothing to fear. But if um, we are averse to certain things, then obviously we... Uh, we at least, at the very least, need to ask ourselves, am I being hypocritical by praying for the return of the Imam when I'm not ready for him? Right? Because many of us, we still love our materialistic lives and societies. I cannot list how many people I've heard praising a society that is un-Islamic over an Islamic society only because of their material benefit. For example, they would tell me things like, well, this is not a Muslim society, but at least I get free meds or at least I'm looked after when I grow old and I'm a senior, or at least this happens or that happens, or at least I have an OHIP card and I can get my surgery done for free. What does the Muslims do? If I went and lived in my back home, wherever it is, that Muslim country, they would not look after me. And they would... So it's all what is in it for me from a material perspective, that I get support, financial support, or health care, or so on and so forth. But if I look beyond that and say, on what basis and principle does this society survive? What are the values it upholds? What are its foreign policies? How does it view Muslims? What states and regimes does it support that are oppressive and unjust to fellow Muslims? Does it uphold immorality? Does it deny the existence of God? Is it an individualistic, godless society? Are things like alcohol and adultery and so on and homosexuality and all these things freely accepted as being normal? If the society itself is rotting at the foundation and its values and principles are wrong, yet I admire it and I love it and I prefer it over other places. Not to say that the other Muslim countries are good. They may have their own issues. They may be dictatorial, they may be monarchies, they may be unjust, they may have their own problems. But that does not mean that I love a society that is based on un-Islamic principles and values. Because then what I am saying is that the Sharia and the laws and the values of the Qur'an are simply historic ideas that were meant for past generations. They are no longer applicable in today's society. But when I firmly believe that no, what the Qur'an holds is right and that is equity and justice for mankind. And I cannot wait for an Imam who will establish a system where these values are upheld and I will live by those principles and make sacrifices to make that a reality. It is then and only then that I have a right to say that I pray sincerely and say Allahumma ajil farajahu without any hypocrisy in me. So we really, really need to look inwards and ask ourselves, why am I praying for him to return? Is it because I'm fed up? Is it because I hate the enemies? I hate the West, or I hate the Zionists, or I hate this and that? Or is it because I really want to see Islamic values shared with humanity and a world that exists on these Islamic principles? So... Without laboring this point, then this would be the fifth reason why individuals might reject the Imam on his. 
uh, return. A sixth reason, and again, this is also a little sensitive, and again, I urge you to take it in the uh, understanding and stride that it is meant to be, because when I speak, given the fact that many of these lectures and majlises are not limited to just one audience, but they tend to somehow make their way on the Internet, and they're heard by individuals even outside this continent or outside what we call the Western world. So understand that in a broader context. The sixth reason is that there tends to be a reliance on traditions and ahadith and riwayats without accepting that some of them may not be reliable. And I understand very well the sensitivity of this. But many a times when we are inflexible and we are driven with pride or with jealousy or with affiliation with one group over the other, we tend to listen to who is saying what rather than what is being said. Or we assume that if it is in a book of hadith, therefore it is true, without giving it much thought. And Imam Ali alayhi salam in Nahjul Balagha, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. He says, the narrators of hadith are many, but the preservers of hadith are few. There are many, many people who can just read hadith for you again and again from lots and lots of sources. But individuals who have the ability or who will take the time to look at that hadith and then look at it in the light of the Qur'an and then make sure what implications this has on the minds of the audience and how this works in society and whether this is agreeable first to his conscious and uh, understanding and then also on the authenticity of those traditions. Those would be fewer. As an example, now, the point that I wish to make here is one of being rigid and proud and refusing to accept that some of the traditions or ahadith that we read about the coming of the Imam may or may not be true. That is the point I'm trying to make, not a specific example that I'm about to give. I'm going to give you an example, but I cannot stress enough that I am not saying that this is not true. This may very well be true, but it is an example. And it is something that I have heard myself from a scholar um, in the Middle East. This scholar narrates a tradition. He says, when the Mahdi salam returns, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad, his light and his nur will radiate with such brilliance that it will replace the sun and the sun will no longer be needed and it will become useless. And the humans of this world will then rely on the light and the nur of the Imam for their existence rather than the sun. Okay. And this scholar who is respected by many went on to um, argue and prove this through different ways. For example, he took the verse of the Quran that says, وَأَشْرَقَتِ الْعَرْضُ بِنُورِ رَبِّهَا That the earth shall be lit and will light with the light of its Lord. And then he discussed the word Rabb to say that Rabb does not always mean God. Rabb means one who sustains or one who looks after or a Lord, even in the general sense as the Lord of the house. For example, a homemaker or a housewife is sometimes in Arabic called Rabbatul Bayt. So in that sense, he said that the Rabb that is mentioned is the Mahdi. That the earth shall shine with the nur of its Rabb. Okay. Now, we don't know whether this tradition has been verified or not, and he may very well have verified it, and it may very well be true, as I said, I am not challenging that hadith. But it then raises other questions that sometimes we are not able to answer. For example, someone who heard this tradition then had questions for me. He said, wasn't the Prophet greater than the Imam? Why didn't the light of the Prophet outshine the sun? So we say, well, maybe Allah hid the nur of the Prophet, to protect him from the enemies. He said, well, isn't the Imam on the earth today? If he is, then why does his light not outshine the sun today? Then you may argue again and say, well, Allah is hiding his light right now to preserve and protect him from the enemies, but when he returns, his light will manifest. So then he asks me, well, then when it is night time, the sun sets and we are able to sleep, but if the Imam is present, then the light will always be present. Does it mean his light will go away in the night? So you see, the questions keep coming and at some point you are clutching at straws to explain it. 
This does not mean that the tradition is false. It may actually be true, but might have a meaning that is beyond my understanding. It may have a meaning that is symbolic, for example. But the point I'm trying to make, and again I want to stress this, is not this particular hadith. The point I'm trying to make is that there are individuals who will take a tradition and they will hold on to it with absolute inflexibility and rigidity and say, this has to happen. If this does not happen, I will not accept this individual as the imam. Whereas we need to be aware and cognizant of the fact that with hadith, there may be a hadith that were forged, there may be a hadith that are true, but when they manifest themselves, they will show themselves in a different manner, not in the manner we expect it to. As an example, I mentioned last year that one of the signs we are given is that uh, for the coming of the, of the Imam salam, is that the sun will rise from the west. And we gave an example, we said, it does not necessarily mean that the world will stay the way it is and the sun will now start rising from the west. Scientists talk all the time of the melting of ice on the North Pole and they talk of as the ice melts, there could be a tilting of the earth on its axis and there could be what they call a polar shift. And if a polar shift was to happen and the earth was to rotate completely, they say there would be a lot of catastrophe. There would be all kinds of landslides. There would be water covering where there is land. There would be new land resurfacing from the ocean, which might explain the one third of the population dying that we talked about yesterday. But if the earth was to rotate on its axis and the north pole was to be the south and the south was to be the north, then the sun would still rise as it does today. But now your east becomes your west and your west becomes your east. So your understanding of the sun rising from the west might not necessarily happen exactly the way you want it to happen. And this is very important to remember. So along all these discussions that we have been having from the very first night, the point we have tried to stress is that the coming of the imam will require human beings to be compassionate, to be understanding, but to expect things to happen through sacrifices and through ordinary means. There may be signs that will happen, but we must not be fixed and rigid to say it must be this way or that way. We must be open to the idea that things might happen different from how we expect it. And indeed they will happen, because in that lies a trial. Otherwise there wouldn't be a trial, would there? It would have been very easy then to decide on uh, what is haq and what is batil. Now I give you an example from history, from the Muslim history, that will make it a little easier to understand. If you can recite a salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Consider, for example, the history of the Jews and the Christians in the Middle East. When Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam came to the, when he declared himself as the Prophet of Allah in Mecca, there were a lot of Jews living in Medina, which at the time was called Yathrib. And there were a lot of Christians living in an area that is called Najran, a group of whom had come for which the incident of Mubahala took place. When you read the books of history to say, how did the Jews and the Christian end up in the Middle East, it is interesting to note that they came there because they had read in their books prophecies that a prophet would come from the Middle East. Which means the Jews primarily came to Medina waiting for the prophet. This was why they were there. And the mushrikeen in Mecca, the polytheists, were not waiting for him because they didn't have a scripture. They didn't have Tawrat or Injil. The irony of the whole thing is that when this prophet rose and declared his mission, who were the people who accepted him and who were the ones who opposed him the most? Initially, yes, he faced a lot of resistance from the Quraysh and he had to migrate to Medina. But even in Medina, the people who accepted him were the mushrikeen, were the polytheists, were the ones who worshipped idols. And then Mecca. The Jews who had been waiting for him all their lives, they are the ones who opposed him. They are the ones who fought him at Khaybar and Khandak and so on. There were some who changed and accepted him. But despite the proofs he gave them, if you read the Quran, the lame excuses and arguments they gave are listed in the book. Which is very, very ironic, isn't it? 
and we seek refuge with Allah from such an incident taking place with the Muslim community, where large numbers of us wait for the Imam, and large numbers of non-Muslims are oblivious to him. But when he establishes a world based on justice, then a large number of those who do not know him today accept him in droves, and those who claim to follow him deny him. History repeats itself, isn't it? So we need to ask ourselves what went wrong there and why would it not go uh, right with us. It is very, very important that we look at this. And this is not something that I am supposing or imagining, but we have this from a hadith. A hadith, one tradition that I read just today, which said that when the Mahdi alayhi salam returns, a large number of those who claim to follow him will deny him. And there will be people who worship the sun and the moon who will accept his message. So this is something that is there in the books, and it is something that we need to be uh, cautious about. Now a final point that I wish to discuss uh, before we wrap up this three-day discussion is a lack of purity of the heart, which is the major reason for which people would deny the Imam. And this reason is actually the reason for all the other previous reasons that we have discussed. That that reliance on miracles or that not being willing to sacrifice or that idea of only expecting proof through the intellect or that hypocrisy or that uh, uh, being rigid in our belief or pride or jealousy or whatever it may be, its source and its root is that lack of purity of the heart. And the opposite is also true that those who would be most readily willing to accept the message of the Imam would be those who are purest of heart. Which therefore then leads us to conclude that the best way to identify the Imam is not through the signs and the miracles, nor through the intellectual proofs as much as through the purity of the heart. Because the heart will always, when purified, it will always testify to that which is just and true. It will always deny that which is false. The others will also play a role, knowing the signs are important the miracles, the signs, that the, the, the things that are in the possessions of the Imam that he will produce, the Zulfiqar of his forefathers, the Aba, the turban, all those signs that we have in books are, have their place. But it is the purity of the heart, we shall conclude, that will be the deciding factor on who accepts and who denies uh, um, the Imam. And this is true for all matters. We said yesterday when discussing the ayah, فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ مَرَضٌ فَزَادَهُمُ اللَّهُ مَرَضًا That whether we seek to accept God, the Qur'an itself says that it guides some and it misguides some. يَهْدِي بِهِ كَثِيرًا وَيُضِلُّ بِهِ كَثِيرًا And we have discussed this ayah again in the past. That whether we wish to verify is the Qur'an the word of God, or whether we wish to prove the existence of God, or whether we need to understand the reality and the truth of Ali Muhammad, or whether we want to identify whether the individual in front of me is the Imam or not, the most striking proof and the greatest evidence will come from the purity of my heart. If you look at the Messenger of Allah again as an example, peace be on him and his family, when he came and began preaching his mission, he did show signs to the Quraysh. One of his most astounding signs was the splitting of the moon that the Quran testifies to. He showed them signs like taking pebbles in his hand and the pebbles would glorify Allah. Imam Ali salam in Nahjul Balagha talks of a miracle where he says that the Prophet summoned a tree and the tree came out and it walked towards him on its roots. So miracles like these were shown but they still denied the proof. Now, look at the arguments that those who denied him gave. It is typically the kind of arguments that you will find in a petty society. They gave arguments like, look at this man, he's dividing our community. He's causing fathers and sons to fight. He's calling mothers and daughters to fight amongst themselves. He's confusing the youths. This was the arguments. Do you not see that in our society sometimes? The very same arguments will be brought forth. That this person is confusing. The idea is, is what is being said truth or not, or falsehood? Not the fact that we want to hold on to what we have seen from our forefathers. And then look at the people who accepted the message. The first ones to accept the message of Islam were the poor, were the downtrodden, were the oppressed, were the slaves. And what was their argument and reason for believing? It wasn't the fact that we saw him splitting the moon. It was the fact that this man tells us not to bury our daughters alive. It was the fact that this man tells us that women are human beings 
They are not to be treated subhuman. In other words, they saw that he stood for truth, he stood for justice, he stood for human rights, he stood for that which was fair and equity for all human beings. And they were attracted to it foremost because they were oppressed and they were victims of those circumstances. That he was against materialism, that he was against idol worship, that he was against that which demeans a human being. So on the same basis, if we purify our hearts, then when the Imam comes forth, because we know from the books of Ahadith that there will come forth at least 60 liars claiming to be the Mahdi before the Imam. So there is no shortage of false Mahdis. In identifying the right one, we will know the right one because of the fact that he will not ask for people to worship him. He will not ask to control people. He will not want political power for the sake of it. It will not be a movement based on capitalism or materialism. It will be one that will speak for the oppressed. It will, it will be one that will speak against oppression and against injustices. So this purity of heart is very, very important in making us understand uh, the reality and the truth of the Imam. If we can recite a salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Now in the uh, time that I have left uh, for tonight, as uh, we have said tonight, is a very, very special night. Uh, as far as our three-day discussion is concerned, um, this would be a conclusion to it. We have discussed the signs of the Imam and the sequence in which they uh, would occur. And we have listed various signs for which people might reject the Imam. And I think that is enough food for thought for us to go back and on a night such as this to think and ask ourselves, uh, are there signs here that I can relate to myself and are there areas that I need to work on to find sincerity and purity in myself and say, am I ready for the Imam? Um, I have some other interesting ahadith related to the Imam, uh, some partly talking of the signs of his return, some partly talking of his Shias and talking of uh, the condition of the people at the time and how difficult it would be to hold on to true faith. I will share these with you if time permits. Uh, but before we do that, uh, just so that we do not uh, run out of time without having discussed the importance of the 15th night of Shaban, I wish to uh, switch to that and talk first about the importance of tonight. And then inshallah, if time permits, we will come back and talk about some of the ahadith related to our Imam, if we can recite aloud, Salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. This night uh, that will come upon us uh, at Maghrib is also known as the night of Bara'a. And uh, Bara'a is to disassociate or to free oneself from something. And so for, therefore, we are told from the ahadith and riwayat that it is a night to free ourselves from sins. It is a night to purify ourselves. We know from uh, Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq sallallahu wa sallam wa alayhi, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad, that he reports from his father, Imam Muhammad al-Baqir sallallahu wa sallam wa alayhi, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad, that besides the night of Qadr, which takes place in the month of Ramadan, there is no greater night in Islam uh, besides uh, this night. So after the night of Qadr, this night that we shall have the fortune, inshallah, of witnessing and, and, and worshipping Allah in is the second greatest night uh, for us. It is a night in which Allah promises forgiveness to anyone who is willing to sincerely repent. Anything one asks from Allah, if it is not sinful and not evil for him, and not bad in his interest, Allah will grant it on this night, insha'Allah. It is a night in which a person's destiny is also decreed in matters of uh, the life that one has, who will live another year and who will die within the next year. That is also decreed on this night. Misfortunes and bala epidemics, illnesses, all these are also written for people. It may not be punishment, it may be trials for people and tests for people, but they are decreed on this night. And hence you see that the Yaseen we recite and the du'as that we seek refuge with Allah from min at ta'uni wal waba wa mawtil fuj'a and sudden death and so on, they are in line with this. 
those who shall be blessed with pilgrimage to Mecca is also decreed on these nights. So for those who have a true longing and yearning for this, this is an excellent night to pray for. Now we also know that these things are decreed on the night of Qadr. So many people will often ask, is there a contradiction here? On what night exactly is this being decreed? And there are two understandings of this. One understanding is that some matters are decreed on this night and others on the night of Qadr. There is another understanding which perhaps is more uh, favorable uh, or favored, and that is that the initial decree is done tonight, but it is written as a matter that will not change, as something that is Amrun Mahtum on the night of Qadr. So that Allah gives us a time uh, between this night and the night of Qadr to continue praying to Him and pleading to Him to give us the good if it wasn't in our destiny and to remove that which might be harmful or disliked by us if it has been decreed for us. Sheikh Abbas Qummi also writes in Mafatir al-Jinan that it is also the night, the milad of Sultan al-Asr wa Imam al-Zaman al-Hujjat ibn al-Hassan arwahuna lahu al-fida salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad and therefore there may be good reason that Allah chooses a night like this, which is the second greatest night in Islam, for the birth of His final proof. And so it is a very special night as well, and uh, we have riwayat that recommend us to stay up all night in worship for those who are able to. Uh, in one hadith, for example, from uh, Imam Zainul Abidin alayhi salam, he says, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Muhammad. He says, "Man ahya hadhi al-layla lam yamut qalbahu yom tamutu fihi al-qulub." Whoever stays up on this night in worship of Allah, his or her heart will not die on the day when hearts will die. So, uh, it is highly recommended for those who may be tired, who have had a long day at work, who have to go to work tomorrow. It may be just waking up a little earlier tomorrow morning and showing some sincerity to Allah and saying I was not able to stay up all night but I still wish to be one of those who benefit so in other words let, the, let not this night and tomorrow's day pass like another ordinary night and day and as you know Thursday nights are also recommended for staying up in worship so this is a very very unique year because we're getting the 15th night of Shaban on a Thursday night on Laylatul Ibadah anyway and then Friday itself has its own importance because it is the day when the Imam is born. It is also the day when the Imam is supposed to return because in the ziyarah that we recite of the Imam on Friday, we say, وَهَذَا يَوْمُ الْجُمْعَةِ وَهُوَ يَوْمُ الْمُتَوَقَّعُ فِيهِ ظُهُورَكِ This is Friday, the day in which we expect your return. So tomorrow, the 15th of Shaban, which is his birth, also happens to be the day he returns and also happens to be the day of his birth. And so, therefore, this night and this day is just immersed and soaked with blessings. I am certain that this night Allah is showering His mercy and love on the earth for whoever is willing to take and drink from it. So let it not be an ordinary night, inshallah, my dear brothers and sisters. There is also a lot of recommendation to remember Aba Abdullah al Hussein on this night because there is a very close affinity as well between the Imam of our time and Imam Hussein alayhi salam, and it is a lengthy discussion on how the two personalities are very, very close. But uh, you may have heard this from other ulama. We know, for example, again from uh, Mafatih al-Janan of Sheikh Abbas Qummi, that says, whosoever wishes to be in the presence of 124,000 prophets, anbiya, meaning all the anbiya, or in other words, if you wish to rub shoulders with all the anbiya, from Adam to Khatam, then you should go for the ziyarat of Hussein and be in Karbala on a night such as this. And of course we pray to Allah that inshallah we all have an opportunity once in our lifetime to be in Karbala on a night such as this inshallah. Ameen ya Rabbal Alameen. And just to show us again that on a night such as this let us not worship Allah as a ritual or as a habit or simply with the chatter of the mind but let us silence the mind and open our hearts and show uh, 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 Allah how much we wish to come towards Him with complete surrender, we see that in the Amal as well there is a, a mention of things that hint at this. As an example, Sheikh Abbas Qummi says that if you cannot go for the ziyarat of Hussein, at the very least, he says, 
go out to the open sky. He says, go to the rooftop of your houses, which is obviously from the perspective of the Middle East, uh, which we don't have here. But essentially, he says, go out under the open sky. Then he says, look towards the heavens. This is at the very least, he says. Look towards the heavens, look towards the right, look towards the left. In other words, gaze at the sky for a bit. And he says, if nothing else, then look towards the heavens, look up towards the heavens and say, Assalamu alaikum ya Aba Abdullah. Peace be on you, O Aba Abdullah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. He says, even these two lines should not escape you. Look towards the heaven. Now, here, to me, this has a certain meaning. The meaning is that it is easy to simply stand and read a long ziyarah. And there is a particular ziyarah for Imam Hussein that, inshallah, we shall recite tonight. But what is the idea behind look towards the stars and look towards the right and look towards the left? The idea is that say this with your heart because if you stand out in the open and you look towards the heavens and you gaze to the right and the left for a bit, you will find not only will the world around you become silent, but the mind will be silent as well. The chatter will disappear. There will be a certain peace and tranquility. So he is inviting us that bring a certain composure, a certain tranquility to yourself. And then when there is no ego, when there is no mind, when there is just the real self, then connect with Karbala and say, Assalamu alaikum ya Aba Abdullah. Peace be on you, O oh, Aba Abdullah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. And it is with these two lines that, inshallah, he will reply you from Karbala, inshallah. So let this not escape us, inshallah, on a great night such as this. Sheikh Abbas Kumi as well uh, says that it is highly recommended to pray Salat uh, Ja'far al-Tayyar, which is the Salat which the Prophet of Islam uh, taught uh, Ja'far, the brother of Imam Ali alayhi salam, when he returned from Abyssinia, and he gave it to him as a gift. So there are many, many amals to perform. It is also highly recommended to fast on uh, uh, the 15th of Sha'ban, which is tomorrow. So in whatever capacity and in whatever way we are able to do this, inshallah, let it not uh, escape us and let this be a special occasion where we pray for ourselves, our families, our loved ones, and also we pray for each other uh, and we pray for our communities that inshallah we may thrive and we may continue to work towards our own uh, uh, purity in preparation for the return of the Imam, insha'Allah, if you can recite the salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad wa salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad I have uh, five minutes still and uh, um, I just will share one or two ahadith from the ones that I wanted to earlier and uh, Thereafter, inshallah, we, we uh, have a mawlud and some announcements before uh, salat as well. Uh, these ahadith may appear somewhat uh, depressing, but they are not depressing actually. They are inspiring if we look at them in the right light, because we've all heard of the saying, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. So when certain things are said, they may appear uh, as if we are to lose hope, but actually we are to gain hope and, and, and pull up our socks, if you like, and really rise to the occasion. We have one hadith uh, from the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him and his family. He says to his companions, uh, you are my companions, but my brothers will come towards the end of the times. They shall believe, without, they shall believe in me without having seen me. It will be harder for them to hold on to their faith than to hold a burning piece of coal. Okay. Um, I'm not reading them in Arabic in the interest of time, uh, although they are very beautiful when read in Arabic. He says, there shall come a time on people after you, the Prophet says to his companions. He says, there, there will come a time on people after you. One man amongst them shall have greater reward than 50 of you. They said to him, messenger of God, we were with you at the battle of Badr and Uhud and Hunayn, and the Qur'an was revealed amongst us. How could there be anyone greater than us? He said to them, if you had to bear what they shall bear, you would not have the patience that they shall have. And he explains this in another tradition. He says to his companions, there shall come a time when the heart of a believer will melt like salt melts in water, 
because he shall see sin and wrong being committed around him, all around him, but he will feel helpless, unable to do anything about it. And the believer shall walk amongst people in fear. If he speaks the truth, they will eat him up. In other words, they will just be all over him. And if he keeps quiet, then the anger and the, the, the anguish will consume him from within. And Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq sallallahu wa sallam alayhi says, He says, I swear by Allah, you will be saved. Mankind has no option except that they will be tried, and they will be tested, and they will be sieved until many of you will fall out from the sieve, and they shall not remain of you except very few. And he says in another tradition, I swear by Allah, that for which you have stretched your necks, and that for which you are waiting eagerly, will not come until many of you have lost hope in his return. And he says in another tradition, this is from his father Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam, he says, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Muhammad. If people knew what the Qa'im shall do when he returns, then most of them would wish they never saw him. And I will leave that to our imagination. Um, but Imam Ali alayhi salam tells us, awaiting for the return of the Mahdi, intidhar al-Faraj, should not be something that you lose hope in. Never lose hope in the return of your Imam. And never lose hope that Allah will look to you with mercy. For the best of all actions and the best of all a'mals is intidhar al-Faraj. Is waiting for this relief and for this Imam to return. So, um, there are many other traditions here that I will not uh, narrate. Uh, uh, but just to conclude this, we wish to say that in preparing for our Imam, there are many things we can do. But first and foremost is to purify ourselves. This purification can happen not just by reflection, but by looking at how we lead our lives. One very, very important thing is our source of living and our earning. Because many of the ahadith which I have not narrated here that I was going to, is related around this issue that... Uh, people will fail or people will pollute themselves because of earning a living that is unlawful. Or there will come a time when it will be impossible to earn a halal living. And there are incidents as well that you know, are in the books to say that the people who, are, who met the imam after doing lots and lots of amals and ascetic practices and practicing occult sciences and ilmul jafr and numerology and all, when they finally met the imam, the imam showed them this message again and again that if you purify your livelihood, if you make your living pure, if you're careful of what you eat and what you feed your children, if you carefully look at where your money is coming from, because we think of halal and haram food only as the food itself is the meat halal, but we don't sometimes think of where the money is coming that is purchasing that halal meat. And the message from the Imam time and again is that if we keep this at the forefront of our minds, that what the food that goes into our body should be halal because that goes into our blood system, that affects our thoughts and that affects our hearts, then that is very, very uh, uh, significant that we should look towards this, inshallah. Um, on a night such as this, um, I will be ending with a short dua, which is from the Imam himself, a dua that we recite in the month of Ramadan, in dua al-iftitah. And in these uh, uh, words, we will be complaining to Allah for the absence of our Imam and asking him to return the Imam as soon as possible. And uh, before we do that, we wish to send our greetings on this auspicious and blessed night, first and foremost to Rasulullah himself, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. And then, of course, to all the Imams. And it is important, again, I cannot stress enough to realize the importance and how lucky we are to be the followers of this Imam. Because Allah says in the Quran, يَوْمَ نَدْعُوا كُلُّ أُنَاسٍ بِإِمَامِهِمْ On the day of judgment, we shall call every nation with their Imam. We are going to be called, if we are true and faithful to this Imam, we shall be raised with an Imam who is unique and unparalleled in many, many ways. Such that the other Imams used to long for him and say that if we lived in his times, we would come to his help. And if you think of Allah's relationship with human beings from the time human beings walked on this planet the very first proof of God was Adam 
All the prophets, all the messengers, all the imams, he is the final proof. He is the inheritor and the warith of all the previous proofs of God. So for us to be blessed to be in his, uh, uh, amongst his followers and to be of his Shia and to have that faith to believe in him despite not having seen him is a great, great mercy of Allah, something that we should treasure and hold as precious and we should teach our children to keep that love alive and inshallah remain with it and we also pray to our Imam as well that he should also beseech Allah that his return should hasten and of all the communities of Shias inshallah may he choose us to be of those who come to his aid and may he choose us to be of those who follow him inshallah and may we be true inshallah to him so that on the day we see him not only is are we overjoyed to see him but he is overjoyed to see us inshallah and we pray to Allah inshallah that if he returns in our lifetime, we may be blessed with martyrdom, so that we may roll in our blood for his sake, inshallah. And if we were to die before he returns, inshallah, on a night like this, we should pray that Allah makes us of those who are raised from their graves to help the Imam. And we pray also to the Imam, inshallah, that before we die, if his return is to come after our lives, then at least we may be blessed with a vision of him once in our lifetime, so that that may give us solace and comfort that we are of those that he is pleased with, insha'Allah, and that he is proud to call amongst his Shia, insha'Allah. So we end with this dua uh, from dua al-iftitah, which is also from uh, Imam Sahib al-Zaman, alayhi salam, and we ask Allah and complain to him. Allahumma inna nashku ilayka faqda nabiyyina salawatuka alayhi wa alihi. O oh Allah, we complain to you the absence of our Prophet, your blessings be on him and his family. وَغَيْبَةَ وَلِيِّنَا وَكَثْرَةَ عَدُوِّنَا We complain to you, O Allah, of the concealment of our leader and the abundance of our enemies. وَقِلَّةَ عَدَدِنَا وَشِدَّةَ الْفِتَنِ بِنَا We complain to you, O Allah, of the scarcity of our numbers and the severity of our trials. وَتَذَاهُرِ الزَّمَانِ عَلَيْنَا And we complain to you, O Allah, of the victory of the era against us. فَصَلِّ عَلَى مُحَمَّدٍ وَآلِ مُحَمَّدٍ O Allah, send your blessings on Muhammad and his family. وَعِنَّا عَلَى ذَلِكَ بِفَتْهِمْ مِنْكَ تُعَجِّلُهُ And help us overcome that by granting us an immediate victory. وَبِذُرٍ تَكْشِفُهُ وَنَصْرٍ تُعِزُّهُ وَسُلْطَانٍ حَقٍ تُظْهِرُهُ And grant us an immediate victory, dispersing miseries. Give us a help that strengthens, providing us with an authority of truth which you manifest. وَرَحْمَةٍ مِنْكَ تُجَلِّلُنَاهَا وَعَافِيَةٍ مِنْكَ تُلْبِسُنَاهَا A mercy from you which is clear to us and a well-being from you which clothes us. بِرَحْمَتِكَ يَا أَرْحَمَ الرَّاحِمِينَ We ask you by your mercy, O most merciful, Ameen, Ya Rabbal Alameen. O Allah, we ask you sincerely on this night that you hasten the return of our Imam. O Allah, بِحَكِّ مُحَمَّدُ وَعَلِ مُحَمَّدُ We ask you that through him and through his blessings you fill our homes with barakah. And O oh Allah, bihaqqi Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad, we ask you for the courage to earn a lawful livelihood. We ask you, O oh Allah, to cloth with health those who are ill and maghfira for those who have passed away. Rabbana taqabbal minna innaka anta sami'ul alim. Inna Allah wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala nabi. Ya ayuhal ladhina amanu, sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima.